I've seen. You know what, Max? Here's the thing I'll say about Renfield, as silly as it is. We have not seen a Renfield movie. Yeah. Now, I could really fucking regret saying that <laughs> we when have it comes not. out. But also, like, technically speaking, if you saw a Dracula, just like Dracula 2021 or whatever, you'd just be like, oh, here we go again. And then it's like they say Renfield and you're like, that sounds terrible, but I might see that compared to Dracula. And also for all of the people who are just like, oh, I'm fucking tired of Dracula. Like you could actually like trick some of your audience to going into that movie. Renfield. I was like, what is this about? I don't know this. And the a man going crazy. It's, yeah. Like you have a guy who like gets hired to like work in this castle of like this recluse Lord to do a psychological horror thing of like, is this guy a vampire or is it? am I just going fucking crazy because this insane old man lives alone in a castle and I have to attend to his every need? Yeah. And then something like that. And then like becoming complicit in that. I mean, technically Renfield could be a more interesting character, human character to follow than Jonathan Harker. Jonathan Harker is just like white bread. Yeah. That's his thing. Renfield is the guy who's like, he, he gets won over to the evil influence. I think that's an important part of a lot of vampire movies that people, yeah, a lot of people forget to do though, is that you need a human character a lot of times. Um, because if you don't, then you risk just completely alienating. Cause it's just like, Oh, I've lived forever and I don't fucking care about anything anymore. And it's just like, okay, then I don't care about you. <laughs> like, yeah. Fuck off with this. It's, um, why you always have some human stumbling into Dracula's castle. It's why, Nosferatu, which is still the same thing. You know, I have like, it's told from human perspective rather than the vampire just being like, yo, let me tell you this shit. And there are exceptions, of course, and Rice, but like, even then, it's the vampire telling it to a reporter. Even more explicit in that one. Yeah. Christian Slater's like, what up, dog? You're the vampire. Yeah. And he's, <laughs> I love that, though. Or he's just like, at the end, he's just like, oh, make me a vampire. He's like, you weren't listening, were you? You weren't listening the entire fucking time, were you? But um, an example of what happens when you don't have a point of view reference character can be seen very clearly in the movie that we're doing today on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello there, everyone. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're doing the 2003 masterpiece. smash hit masterpiece work of art, never paralleled Underworld, which was not my pick. What? It was your pick. Are, um, are you serious right Yes. Now? Okay. I, pick- okay. Uh, maybe I did suggest it. That's so weird, though, because I suggested it as, uh, I don't know, not appeasement, but it was like this would bait. be <laughs> bait for Max because we were trying to just think of a movie to do. Um, we're all trying to escape our fears of the apocalypse, and we're just like, uh, what, what can we agree on the when the meteor is coming down and we're all going to die by April. Yeah. Uh, the meteor is not coming down yet. We are still in the midst of coronavirus outbreak just for anyone in the future listening to this who wants to know exactly why we died. Uh, it's probably related to that the protagonist of a game who needs to find audio logs <laughs> in order to progress on their <laughs> side quest. But we fucking died because yeah. of the coronavirus. Um, no, uh, we, we've been holed up. It's very crazy here in the U S especially because we live right outside New York, which is the epicenter right now of U S infections. We just got the news, uh, yesterday for us that USA is number one. Yeah. Finally, we have the USA, mo- USA, <laughs> the most cases of coronavirus in the entire world. Yeah. Go us. But anyway, uh, we decided to distract ourselves from that by watching this masterful film Underworld. And uh, Max, even though it was my pick, I'm going to say that you should talk about it first because you have a much stronger relationship with it. (laughs) And also it's just like, it's, I think that's an important thing to talk about with this. Like it is kind of a comfort food movie. Yes. We describe it as a masterpiece, but listen, people, it's like a trashed piece. It's okay. Does that make sense? So when you, (laughs) I would describe this movie as a goth Pringles. Um, (laughs) Trademark. And <laughs> it's also my screen name on AIM. But uh, <laughs> but when you watch this movie, and we said this for the last movie, and I don't want like people to be just like, oh, they're just doing like easy movies. But like Underworld, this movie, like when you eat a good meal, you're just like, oh, this is the best thing I have. But when you eat Pringles, 
Pringles because they taste salty and good and you're hungry at the moment. And afterwards, you could just be like, oh, those are Pringles. But like, you knew what you were getting into when you bought the fucking Pringles. Yeah. This is uh, Underworld, <laughs> which is by far not one of my favorite vampire movies. Um, but it is a vampire movie and it does have some interesting visual things and some hints at interesting lore, which I like. And there's so, some interesting, like it's, it's more of what this movie hints at is what I <laughs> like. And I think that's why I went on to watch every single one of the movies. Right. Um, part just of this like self-hatred and like maybe someday that they'll get good. And I still maintain to this day that even though I don't think, critics agree with me i would have to, rotten tomatoes isn't a good indicator but like i think rise of the lichens is probably the best one okay because in this movie we get all of the like the oh what happened to lucian what what's all of this and that's just like oh it's a straightforward story and we know where it ends and the writers actually knew where it was going so like they have an end point too so they had a solid idea so they're just like yeah. oh, okay so we're from a to b cool a plus um and also we get the two best actors from this movie as like prominent characters throughout all of that. Right. So, and by the way, when was the first time you watched this? Just to be clear. Um, so I was, did you uh, see this in the theater? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, this was another, this, I always mentioned that my parents were relatively strict when I was growing up of what I could see. This was completely out of just like no vampire, sexy lady shooting movie was not a movie they would have let me see. But like a couple of years later, this was on like sci-fi or TNT or something mm -hmm. like that. Oh, this is such a TNT. Yeah. So like FX movie. I, I saw all of them like right up until the fourth one just on TV. Cause they play all the fucking time. Yeah. On TV. And I think the fourth one came out like 2011. Yeah. 2012. Um, that sounds about right. And industri yeah. I, an industrial band, I had like, did one of the songs on the soundtrack for that An industrial band you like in a <laughs> the fourth one is really like the the fourth one is okay we, we can go on on my very strong opinion yeah on, we could save it for the commentary but basically the, these are trash vampire movies <laughs> that are my personal trash because i enjoyed them um i liked them a lot more when i was a teenager mainly because I've just like, I, I hadn't seen this particular breed of vampires before of just like, we're an ancient coven and we're locked in this eternal war. And there's like politics between the elders and there's internal infighting between the vampires. And we're all trying to struggle for a sling, sliver of power, which is not expanded upon in this movie upon rewatching it. And it's barely there, but I liked that idea and I had never seen it before. And then I discovered Vampire the Masquerade, the role-playing game and the video games based on it. And I'm like, oh, they just stole all of this and did it really, really badly. And instead of developing that, they just did dual pistols and shooting. And but you know what, Max? That's not the worst thing. There could be no Vampire the Masquerade-esque movie there compared to one that's just... I mean, you know what, Max? It worked for some people. It did work for some There's people. There's five of these movies. There is. Um... And as I've said before, I have a friend that we have mutually assured destruction pact with each other that every time there's a new Resident Evil movie, I see it with him. And every time there's a new Underworld movie, I see it with him. That's probably over now. But well, you say that. Yeah. Now, as I say that under yeah, Underworld six, uh, the lichens rise again for real this time is being made. But I am not against that. Why not? <laughs> but yeah. I, I I would be lying if I said that I had never thoroughly enjoyed these movies. It's just that having realized that I don't even know if it was deliberately stolen. It might have just been ingrained in like vampire culture at the time. Right. But having found something that scratches that itch like fully rather than just like tantalizing me with the idea of it. Right. Um, I've kind of grown past these a little but it's one of those things that I've already sunk so much time into and have <laughs> such a knowledge of that I'm like, sure, why it's not? It's just the familiarity of it makes yeah. it easy to sink back into. And uh, but it makes like, sense. Rewatching the first one is kind of jarring because like they get a little bit more tame with the fucking chaotic editing in the other ones. But right. this one, the director was he had only directed music videos up until this point, from what I understand. I don't know. Um 
And you can kind of tell that because there's a lot of like jarring rapid edits and just like weird non con like it's non conventional storytelling and like where plot beats and character beats and character histories and explanations of the lore should be are all over the place. But I'm not going to go into full rant mode at the moment. Instead, Austin, since this was your pick and you have a deep, passionate history with these movies, why don't you tell me what's going on with this? Well, uh, I mean, obviously you're the one with more of a history with it. I think I actually saw this in the theater, though, because I was brought to many movies as a child. It's just like my dad wanted to see movies. He's like, well, I'm not going to go alone. So then he would bring me to see them. This is how I saw all sorts of movies when I was like less than 10 that are just like, what the fuck? (laughs) Um, So I I saw this one. I'm surprised this movie is rated R, honestly. It really should not be yeah i don't think maybe there's no there's no sex in it or anything it's just like whatever we can talk about that during the commentary but um it's definitely not as like horrifying or weird a movie it's just it's a very familiar type of movie and i do much in the same way you compare them to goth pringles yeah uh something that sticks out in my mind about this movie is the way it is consumed or the way I feel like it can be consumed, which it is kind of like a trashy, like genre action movie. And because of that, I'm like on its side in a weird way. Um, I maybe, maybe we can compare it to a movie like, you know, pitch black that we've done where it's like, this is just like trashy or whatever, but it's like, it's the type of genre action type movie that maybe you and I feel nostalgia for because we're like, I would totally live in a world where, movies like this were coming out all the time instead of like superhero number 99 or whatever, or some part of some huge expensive tentpole series. Right. Yeah. Just, I'm excited for these like nineties action, trashy genre movies. Those are the fun movies to me that are like, I'm totally okay with existing. And I love that this movie has five of them in in its (laughs) franchise. Um, and, uh, even though much, much in the same way that you feel like this movie like promises things that it doesn't fully deliver on. I kind of agree. Um, and I also am not nearly as familiar with the sequels, even though I've seen a number of them, I just don't remember them uh, where I feel like maybe they do one thing or the other, perhaps better than this one. So who knows about that? You're going to be the authority on that in so, the commentary. track. Somebody put, yeah, pulled good old Len aside and <laughs> was just like, Hey, you know, story structure and like maybe just like consistency in. Did he work. direct all of them? Um, I know not, the yes. fifth one was not directed by him. I believe he directed the first three and okay. then afterwards was just a producer on them. Yeah. After the fourth one, he got divorced <laughs> from Kate Beckinsale. So. Okay. It was just sort of a, uh, we already had this in pre-production in thing. The ether, yeah. So. Obviously, that's his whole own story. Yeah. But I just really appreciate this type of like trashy genre movie. Um, and also, like, I wish I could think of a better type of word than trashy. Um, I, when I say trashy, I'm not trying to like denigrate this movie or insult it, even though it's not like a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination. And there are plenty of things about it that I think you could laugh at or poke fun at. But I feel and like we will. Oh, we certainly will. But I feel like trashy more describes the way in which I engage with it more so than the thing itself. Does that make sense? And the reason I engage with it that way is has to do to the content. And that is not necessarily saying anything, making any sort of judgment about the content that said, I think it's not a perfect movie. Um, Like you were saying, there's lots of like editing things where it's like, I feel like we could have just cut this out or whatever. Um, It has like pacing issues um, there's some weird performance things, but also it's like, it has enough to keep it slightly interesting at, you know, the dry moments. And then it's just kind of like funny and amusing and harmless at other points. So I don't yeah, mind it at but all. also it's two hours and 15 minutes. It is way too long for sure. <laughs> yeah. There's there like when your movie could be an hour and a half long, it, there is easily 45 minutes you could trim out of this movie and rearrange. Sure. They take the character stuff very seriously to the point of like emphasizing it and elaborating on it. And then they just don't make it interesting enough to justify the length. So you're like, you're trying to tell this epic family drama and it's like the most basic shit. And now it's like two hours because we focus so much on it. But also, I don't know. It's, 
I don't want to like punch this movie. It's like punching down, Max. I don't want to. I know. Like, it's not worth it. But, yeah. uh, but it's like this movie does, has some fun things and it's a part of like an, an evolution of vampires. We love vampires, right? So we're on team vampires already. Yes. And, we, and werewolves. Spectator film podcast. Put that down. We, we are pro vampire here. And werewolves. We love these monster things. And it's just an evolution of that that we kind of can enjoy and, and watch. Um, as long as we don't take it like too seriously. <laughs> um, but there's some fun, interesting things in here. Uh, we're going to be talking about like a cyborg manifesto, bring that back, uh, post-humanism. We're going to be talking about like the change in depictions of vampires and werewolves. Now it's different in this movie. We're going to be talking about, you know, the weird aesthetic that this movie is participating in the very nineties, like early matrix. <laughs> Yeah, the women in spandex with dual <laughs> pistols, that very specific time period. Aesthetic. Yeah, it reminds me of something that's like vaguely anime, maybe, even though I don't, I really don't know anything about anime, but it Austin's seems thinking, reminiscent to me. Of Austin's thinking of Ghost in the Shell, everybody. Yeah. From um, a resident weeb here on the Spectator Film Podcast. Women in like spandex bodysuits with guns. Uh, that's an anime thing for sure, right? Well, spandex bodysuits is usually mecha anime, which is the giant robot ones. Okay. But just saying. But it is a thing. And it is something from the 90s. You've got like the yes. Crow, Matrix, Blade. Um, they're all sort of in the same Back milieu. when goth was cool. Yeah, and it was like, it wasn't too bad. It was like, yeah, this is fine. <laughs> I like this aesthetic. So it's it's got lots of fun, silly things in it like that. It's mostly just a harmless movie, which as far as I'm concerned is like fine for if you're going to be in the apocalypse coronavirus well, lockdown. Let me, let me put it this way. I would rather have 100 Underworld movies than... Uh, yet another Marvel a hundred million dollar blockbuster, <laughs> yeah, film. I don't know if I'd say a hundred. I a hundred like underworld esque movie of just like sure. I wouldn't. No, I don't need a hundred underworlds in a row. But I'm <laughs> saying like, if I can get a hundred of movies on this level, yeah, I would take that every single this time. This type of genre movie, Ant Man sure. three, yeah, and uh, yeah, I I would probably take that as well just because it's just i don't know they're they're engaging in genre instead of just doing brand stuff so i don't know it's it's an interesting movie you can take it or leave it you know but if you're going to watch this movie and you're going to be like picking it apart it's like you're not letting yourself enjoy it uh it's not like interested in that either it just wants to be it's interested in the aesthetic of being a goth movie and then being very extra and goth about everything that's happening in it and i don't know it's just fun to watch people shoot things <laughs> And with Austin saying it's a bad idea to pick it apart, let's go pick it apart, everyone. Sounds good. All right, Max, the underworld is here. Yeah, I know. We've had so many technical difficulties in between <laughs> trying. To I swear to God, the universe has aligned to somehow try to prevent this movie from... <laughs> This from is, being accessible this to This is the 18th time we've tried to record this. 19th, okay. Max. Yeah. Um, but but the 19th time is the charm. That's that's the saying, as as everybody knows. Yeah. Um, so I'm just bewildered after restarting <laughs> this. We've seen that boy jump into the pond so many fucking times. We've seen the opening shot of <laughs> Mila Jovo. These, <laughs> these amazing 3D, t like... <laughs> text effect that they have the chrome it's just perfect we've oh seen god. it so many times oh my god i need to put a quarter in the jar i almost uh, called kate back and sell mila jovovich i was gonna do that at some point to be fair they're somewhat similar although i i don't know if i have any opinions about mila jovovich i feel like um in not in a condescending way but i feel like i'm on kate beckinsale's like side because i feel like she just gets dismissed but it's like no nah, she's fine i think She's a better actress, probably. Um, than Mila jo Jovovich? Yeah. I don't know if, how much of like her work I've seen, though, to be able to judge that. I've seen most of the Resident Evil movies. so. But is that her? That's or true. Or is that just the movie? That is true. It's not like Kate Beckinsale like, lights the world on fire in this performance. No, but like... You do get emotions, I guess. Do you get... Does she... Do you feel like her performance changes throughout the different movies? Um, to a degree, the second one gives her a bit more of like, oh, this is what I'm working for. And like, there's new stuff here and she has to basically like lead Michael around and be like, listen, you can't keep doing this shit. Doesn't he get like slaughtered? He, he 
gets killed, yeah, but um, also kills an elder in the process. But um, that was the whole point of the second one. The third one is going back, explaining Lucian's deal. And the fourth one, um, despite the first two movies being like, oh, maybe the Lycans aren't really the bad guy. The fourth one goes like, no, actually, the Lycans are the bad guy in the future. It's really stupid. Whoa. And then, and then Blood Wars was even worse than that. Oh, um, my God. I kind of love it. Because <laughs> at first, at first, you think the fourth one's going to be oh, sorry, We should be talking about the first one we first. Save it for the boring moments yeah. of this when we have nothing else to talk about. For that opening sequence, it's actually really great imagery. They have like a fun, it looks like they, they matted, it, it, not a matte painting, but it looks like they matted the image together. They composited it together. Um, another example of like early digital compositing, I'm sure we have Mr. Thick here in his giant jacket, not being smooth at all about following terrible at it on suspicious hoodie dude. Honestly, they should have gotten the same umbrella that everybody else seems to have to blend in with the crowd. (laughs) Uh, Nobody Uh, would suspect them. No, it it is kind of comical how over the top the following is. (laughs) Everyone in this opening sequence, they're supposedly trying to keep a low profile, but every single one of them telegraphs their presence to everyone around them. Look at the way Kate Beckinsale just came around that like pillar. She's like, Ooh, she like leads with her nose as if she's being extra inquisitive, Max. Yes. And she looks at the, that guy. She makes awkward eye contact. <sighs> what was that? That was like a moan. Cause like she has no reason to be interested in him right now. But because we have to find out later that it's a revelation to her that they were following him. So wait, yeah. <laughs> so she's just like, so she just checked him out and yeah. then she's like, wait, fuck. the guy I was checking out was also like important. Oh my God. Fuck. And wow. Then, okay. I just noticed Mr. Thick also shoves people out of the way. Yes. He just straight up pushes them. So no one is interested in keeping a low profile. They're terrible at it. Yeah. Maybe this is why the Lycans are losing the war. <laughs> do you mean it's because every time they see a vampire, the first thing they do is they just straight up pull Uzis out of their vest and, and start blowing bloods. everything away. <laughs> you also pointed out the like maybe unintentional gaffe of just like having a large black man <laughs> yell bloods and pull out two Uzis and start shooting up a public place. Yeah. Circa I, I, 2003. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this was written by a white man. Ugh. Ugh. That, that's tone deaf. But I, I mean, it's just th- this movie is too innocent and silly to have any awareness of like that doesn't mean it gets off the hook. But no, still. but um, but no, there's all sorts of good stuff happening here. Um, oh, the, the cape swoosh. swoosh. I love that. Swoosh. That's the drinking game for this movie. And if you want to drink along with this, the official drink of this movie is Bacardi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's that's also a very good point. Max. If you've been noticing. <laughs> Max, the movie, I would not have picked up on that if you hadn't told me. Obviously. The movie is not being explicit about it or anything. Oh, God, yeah. There's there's car pl- product placement for this, too, but Bacardi remains as the drink for this movie, <laughs> these movies, as the series goes on. But Maybe they're becoming the new J&B, but for goth, Pringle, vampire movies. <laughs> <laughs> he just knocked that guy over for no reason. Wow, I am loving the way that character is just like pushing humans all over the place. Okay, so we establish human guy is a nice dude who cares Do we about- know he's a human guy? I was confused about that during this opening sequence. I feel like this is the first instance where you realize like maybe even- We don't. I was referring to him as human guy. I, I guess we can call him Michael, but like- he Michael. Ca- he cares about other people. Um, But then- <laughs> Yeah, then even though I would say this is probably one of the cleaner action sequences in the movie, because you, for the most part, have a general idea who's doing what, which can't be said for a lot of the action scenes. The fact that two of the vampires look identical and one of the werewolves also kind of looks like one of the vampires. They just cast like model looking model white dudes with the same color of hair. Yeah. So. It's very confusing. You're like, wait, who's this one? Is that the vampire? Is that the werewolf? Yeah. The only visual like difference immediately is that the vampires tend to be slightly more like lean in their like body structure. And they, they're wearing like the black latex, whereas the werewolves are wearing like the rundown. Yeah. 
overcoat type things. Yeah, which will, of course will play into the way we associate these two different types of monsters with uh, class and race, which is going to become a big thing throughout this movie. Which would work better if it wasn't dark lighting the entire time and I could see visually distinct things. Sure. I mean, I don't know. I They could have done way more to, to make them visually different, especially during later combat scenes. And I'm sure we're going to bring that up plenty. Um, but as of right now, when you get moments like this, the very first werewolf transformation, I kind of really do appreciate the way they're interested in using shadow and just yes. trying to make it as abstract as possible. This is probably the best transformation in the movie, would you say? No, yeah, definitely. You, have, you quick cuts to hide the CGI, you have the flickering light, and then poof, you get the pounce and the quick subway. cut with the subway. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, and, very well done. And they managed to motivate it in an interesting way where they create the abstract light show by having it be like, it's a rundown train station and then, Oh, the subway's coming by. So now all these lights are reflecting off of everything. It works. It works. It's clever. They're like taking cues in a good way from movies like matrix with stuff like that. And then they take cues in a bad way when they do like lazy, yeah, like bullet time stuff. Or not even bullet time. It's just like no, because bullet slow time, motion. Bullet time is expensive and very hard to shoot. Yeah, so. I don't know if they had as much confidence in these action scenes. And even though it's a little bit like discombobulating, I think I I enjoyed this moment of the scene. Think about how long we've gone without dialogue. I just appreciate their commitment to just having it be Kate Beckinsale try to follow this. Well, yeah, because the only dialogue we've gotten is one bloods. And <laughs> yes. two, Kate Beckinsale saying there's a war against the Lycans, um, yeah. which I'm not necessarily one for. Oh, swoosh. Yeah, that cape swoosh. I, I am one for that cape swoosh, <laughs> but I'm not necessarily one for dumping all your exposition at the beginning of the movie. But if you are going to, ooh, we get this nice visceral rage beast coming out of Kate Beckinsale as she kills. I, I like that. That's subtle transition of her fangs getting longer and her eyes getting more blue with the contest. I think that's the only visual like all, like transformation that happens for the vampires. As far yeah. as I can tell is that they just, well, their they eyes get are bigger fangs and yeah. their eyes become like more dilated. Well, their eyes are just kind of yeah. inconsistent. It's the thing that's different about them, but it's not like there's a specific thing that triggers it. You know, it's just sometimes their fangs get bigger. Werewolf. That that was a Resident Evil moment, like, just like, woof! Look at this cool thing I'm throwing into the camera. And now we're running. But um, that is the, the stuff. Like, one of the problems I have with this is like, as you said, like the vampires, like they don't get a big like physical thing and like a lot of the fighting sequences which you don't like you get early on it's like oh it's gonna be werewolves versus vampires and okay there's visual distinct differences and the werewolves transform when they're not in public so that's gonna be interesting but like a lot of this movie is people who dress similarly <laughs> in dark corridors shooting guns at each other and you not being able to tell who the fuck is who it's goth variant a yeah. shooting at goth variant B and then sometimes variant B also becomes a giant dog. Yeah. Well, sometimes there's crust punks that show up and crust punks. They're just dirty punks. Um, <laughs> punks who haven't taken showers in a couple of weeks. That's gross. It is. Um, <laughs> nobody likes them. Sorry to our one crust. Punk <laughs> listener. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, what would make this movie slightly more fun in my opinion is if, because I'm realizing this now watching this introduction of like werewolf fight club society is if they were also pirates. They do look like a uh, dropkick Murphy fans, but what? <laughs> no. Uh, what do they have to do with pirates? <laughs> Nothing. You just brought them up before. And so they were fresh in my mind. Yeah. Uh, just to antagonize you. Oh um, no, they would make, this would be a great werewolf pirate crew. It's, um, <laughs> uh, there, there is a, Scottish pirate metal band that's <laughs> great that these guys look like they could all be members or fans of but yeah wouldn't it be fun to be like the vampires like fuck we're getting raided by those stupid ass werewolf pirates yeah <laughs> and they're, they got their little hats and parrots <sighs> look at those deep V's on those naked werewolves though 
Lucian, you're my favorite character in this movie, but that's that's your one sin is you tell those werewolves. Stop to- scratching each other. We need you to not have scratches for our werewolf magazine. Yeah. We need to raise money for the resistance effort. What are you doing? Our GoFundMe is fucking terrible. You have the best V's in our movement. <laughs> we cannot we cannot harm your stomach V's. We need you for the calendar. I love how she's just waving her gun around when she walks in here. And like for, uh, for, a, just, ma- for a mansion this big, do all the vampires really just hang out in the main lobby? I like don't know. lounging on couches and whatnot and chain smoking next to each other. They must have <laughs> removed the uh, fire alarms in that building, which is illegal. <laughs> and also like as vampires, one of the few things that can kill you is fire. You think you might want to keep your fire alarms up to date. Come on, vampires. Stop just all being blonde aristocrats and chain smoking and actually do something. But yeah, so um, we've mostly been cracking jokes so far. One thing I wanted to go back and talk about at the beginning before we get too far away from it is how really those opening shots are really solid. Yeah. And I think they do set up some of the thematic content of this movie, trashy though it may be, silly though it may be at times. It has some interesting thematic stuff that's going on. Um, and maybe that is also just something that's germane to this sort of cycle or wave of vampire movies that you, you would see coming out at this time, stuff like this, obviously, but then also blade is another really big one. Yeah. Um, and then it's, it's much later, but a movie like Daybreakers, do you remember that? It's also like a corporatocracy vampire. Yeah. Dystopic overlord thing. So there's a few movies like this coming out at this time. And, uh, I think, it's really interesting because you get that opening sh- sequence and they're perched on the ceilings, not the ceilings, but the roofs of these giant buildings. And it's kind of like comparing them to gargoyles visually. And they're like surveilling everything and they're following these people. And it's like espionage, like, and we, we were talking about genre in our prep screening. And I put forward the possibility that this movie is kind of immediately right off the bat positioning both the vampires and lichens almost as if they're like in a post cold war espionage movie. And by that, I mean the difference between like having agents that are sort of fighting each other in a covert underground way in a cold war setting, it would be more on behalf of like national entities. Whereas post cold war, it seems to be much more about like underground groups or corporations, you know, going after one another. That's secret cabals, et cetera. Et cetera. That's vampire, the masquerade. Yeah. That's which I, I'm going to keep bringing up. I know, but I mean, it might be really worthwhile. Uh, we didn't do this type of preparation for this movie, but I think it might be interesting if you actually did like a deep dive analysis of this movie through vampire, the masquerade. Well, that's There's like a reference text. That's the thing though. Like the second you do, this movie becomes much more disappointing, at least from my point. Sure. Because, it hints, this movie hints at like, okay, there's the, all these elders and there's these old rituals that they go through and it's like, oh, you need to awaken them at this point and they could, they sealed themselves away and long time ago the lichens were our slaves and they did this and like whatnot. But it's not there. And even though there's five movies of this, like some of it gets expanded upon, but like a lot of it doesn't. And the fourth and the fifth movies just jump the ship entirely and create new shit to go off of that's dumb. Vampire the Masquerade like actually deals well with one, the psychological effects of being a vampire, the socioeconomic implications of different people who are bit like which clans target, which people and how they choose. Whereas like there's clans of people who only target like CEOs and are upper comers to be part of their clans. And then there are other like lower clans that like, target rabble rousers and whatnot. So and then in- vampires that never shower. Yes. Crust vampires, you might say. Nosferatu's in Vampire the Masquerade. Um, Is that actually real? Yeah. They don't shower? Well, they look like Count Orlock, all of them. So they live in sewers and don't shower, yeah. But, but um, so there's like a disparity between vampire society yeah. and whatnot. And it that's that's the stuff I really like about this. And it's what I always wanted out of these movies. And I guess it's a silly play thing to ask, but like, that's what the Matrix was really about at the end of the day. Like, was like the Matrix was a flashy, stylistic action movie with societal undertones. And like, when you ask people about the Matrix today, like, take the red pill and the stuff about that. Even well, it has it was, meaning. Yeah, yeah. And I think 
what we're arriving at sort of, oh, here's more <laughs> surveillance. Enhance computer. Yes. <laughs> um, God, that moment just makes me kind of crack up a little when she walks in wearing the dress. And it's like, what the fuck is going on? And then she's like, you should put this dress on. And it's like, <laughs> I'm working. Excuse me. Kate Beckinsale is looking at files on a computer in a very serious way. And then this woman is just like, put this dress on. What are you doing? Put a dress on. And it's like, can you just go away? No, she has to put a dress on because the other vampires are coming because uh, they're going to wake up Victor soon. Because they have a party scheduled that's the other weird thing about the vampire stuff and something i think this movie could have done a little bit better is like educating us about how this world is structured through character interactions where the character interactions in this movie are not necessarily defined enough or like i don't know executed well enough to really tell us about what these two characters like standing compared to one another is we know craven is the boss because everyone says that we know craven you know, she wants to fuck Craven, and Craven doesn't care about her all. Craven, which with his outrageous Liberace, yes, outfit on. If you look <laughs> at this shit, it's just like look at his fucking collar. It is bedazzled. What the fuck is going on? That's not a vampire thing. <laughs> of course it is. It, and if it is a vampire thing, that's not like his vampire thing. That's a fun vampire. That's a vampire in Las Vegas. That's not... He's having fun with it. Like, right here. What's the point of being immortal if you die yourself? all the simple pleasures in life? You know, like this fucking collar I'm wearing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, yeah, the point I was trying to say is, like, why... What... This movie was never going to be fully elevated to, like, high art. Yeah. But, like, the reason I don't, like, even... I'm not trying to make a passionate defense of it is I think that Vampire the Masquerade, like a vampire, drained <laughs> any possible hope I had for the series. Well, it's more it. like Vampire the Masquerade shows that it's not inherently stupid or trash. Yes. Which many things, like, it's easy to just dismiss it, but really it's like, you know, it takes a lot of resources and sway to make a movie, right? And it's like, you know, sometimes you don't always have the opportunity to explore things in the way that would be most and vampire- beneficial to the material or like have many opportunities even to explore that material. This was a cycle of movies sort of, and yeah. I definitely prefer blade to this movie, but like, it's not like there were a ton of these going on. Yeah. And vampire, the masquerade is like, that's a tabletop RPG meant for you to start telling your own stories. That's like, yeah. they build the world so that well, you can. Yeah. Like a D and D thing. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's the other thing I really think you putting it in that way, I think is helping me arrive at a conclusion about it where this movie is very interested in the aesthetic of vampire, the masquerade. Yeah. But it does not necessarily motivate everything that's going on in its world in the same way. It is interested in the aesthetic and that's why it feels like a giant pool of items it's playing with, Yeah, but it never, it's like a wide pool. That's only like an inch deep. Because it's interested in the aesthetic and then it does not go further to really like examine everything that's going on. They made their characters and then didn't yeah. develop, bother to develop their backstories. At but. the same time, there's not even necessarily something that's wrong with that. It's just that it also doesn't do that exceptionally well. It is very focused on character. In fact, when we were talking about genre, we were talking about like what type of movie is this like really? And I think we were sort of leaning towards the idea that it's closer to something like a melodrama, which is generally a hard like genre to discuss because it's such a malleable and like messy term. Cause melodrama can be something that's like descriptive of like the quality of a thing, but also can apparently be a, a genre in of itself. But it is something that is, when we say that we mean it's very focused on character interaction and the dynamics between the characters. And it is also something that I feel like I detect in performance. Why does he look so sad? Like he saved her because it's focused on character. Really? This is one of those moments where it seems like you could edit this out. Maybe I know we're ostensibly learning about him, but it's not like his character is very deep. This is what I'm saying where it's like, it's committed to melodrama, but it's not actually, it doesn't have interesting characters. The girl, the girl he liked died in a car crash. We learn later. Yeah. Okay. That's his entire backstory in this movie. Right. Now, it's a way to take it, but you have yeah. to give it some... Oh, I love this moment, by the way. Just going to interrupt myself. Look at the foreground. Oh, <laughs> there goes the van, uh, werewolf legs. 
Yeah. I love that. There's like a little bit of clever stuff in this. I like it. But yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Max, where it's like his character is an inch deep, but making the decision to like have a movie that's two hours about the shit because you're so invested in the character dynamic is a decision to make. They just didn't do it super well, I don't think. Or just well. You can yeah. stop there. You don't need to. I don't want to like, you know, punch down at this movie. It's just... I know, but it deserves it sometimes. And <laughs> if you avoid punching down at it occasionally, people might think that we're allowing it to rise up and considering it a good movie. This is not the rise of the lichens. No. We're punching um, them down. Although, to be fair, now that I've, I've seen this more recently than Rise of the Lichens, because it, it, it could be I have rose-colored glasses for Rise of the Lichens, but I still think that has the most coherent story out of all of them. Or just maybe because I like Lucian like as a character and he seems to have like rocks like the most motivation out of all of them. Yeah, definitely Michael Sheen and Bill Nye seem to give the best performances in this movie. So yeah, if you make a movie with them as the most prominent characters, then yeah, it's going to be more interesting. Also, because Bill Nye, this is just like he doesn't show up until later, but this is just like one of those great performances of his where he makes weird mouth noises. Yeah, I think that's like the main like <laughs> criteria he uses for choosing roles. Does he get to go that or just say ridiculous things? Um, you are not going to, I, I, I've said before that my, my favorite role of his uh, modernly is obviously his role as a CEO of evil corporation and detective Pikachu. Oh my God. But is this the one where you said he like screams about like Mewtwo or something? Yes. He's um, Mewtwo. Mewtwo. I will become the most powerful Pokemon, uh, which is a great thing to hear. I think that's the first time you've peaked audio levels in the history of the show. <laughs> Good. That was, that line deserved it. He definitely hits the peas very hard. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen an actor hit peas as hard as, <laughs> as Bill Nye. I kind of love it. I wish that we were... should do Detective Pikachu on the show at one point. That's, I mean, sure. I don't know. It's actually it was be, it was as good as a movie called Detective Pikachu could have possibly been. It was it voiced by Danny DeVito. No, uh, did he a, voice a Pikachu? No, there was a petition to get him to voice Pikachu in that movie. That would have been good. Uh, it got to him as many signatures where he actually responded to it, and his response is, "What the fuck is a Pokemon?" So oh, he knows what a Pokemon <laughs> is. No, it was uh, Ryan Reynolds who voiced the Pikachu. Oh, I, I see. Okay, I, I, I think Ryan Reynolds can be good. I just yeah, he's not Pikachu. Don't don't worry. the The movie goes on. You know who else would have been a really good choice? Although I think they were definitely dead by the time that movie came out. Was Bob Hoskins? <laughs> yeah, he would have been great. Oh, Bob Hoskins. I don't Danny know DeVito. when that movie came out anymore just because time 2017? is... 2017? Because, no, it was more recent than that, but because time is irrelevant and keeps moving forward and backward. It was either a year or two ago, one of those things, but... Or five. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know. Or it came out in 2010. And... Oh, God, Wentworth Miller. These cop characters... Are they humans? What yeah. the fuck is going on with yeah, these Yeah, we don't understand the entire movie, whether they're humans, lichens, uh vampire that's the weirdest thing sorry yeah. to interrupt you we're watching those cop characters interview wentworth miller who also why is he important just cut him out of the fucking movie um the cop characters are so perfunctory and weird in this and we have no idea if they're vampires or or werewolves or whatever but the reason we're asking that question is probably because they end that scene with one of them doing a weird like lip quiver and it's like what the fuck is that supposed to mean like we can we can assume based on the fact that all the vampires are like aristocratic whatnot that they have like human connections, but that's one of my my main problems with the series as a whole is humans besides Michael don't fucking matter. Like we don't ever get to see a human perspective on this vampire like in war. It's just totally hermetically sealed. Yeah, which is again maybe to connect to that idea of melodrama that we're trying to use and define in discussion of this movie is like the only seemingly the only consequences for any of all this stuff, Max is for the characters involved. And that's it. There's yeah. no like threat to the world. It's just the threat to the werewolf group or the vampire group. Yep. There's no other like dangerous thing that's happening. Apparently. 
I do love this grimy, gross hallway, though. Oh, we were making fun of it earlier, but this Ugh. is the moment she's going to shoot through the floor. This is the, the Mythbusters moment. We see this a lot where werewolves decide to just walk on the side of the wall. Well, yeah. Um, why? Why not? <laughs> it's like... It doesn't seem to be helping them in any way. They're, they're still getting shot. It's because they can't all fit on the floor, Max. I guess. <laughs> like, I feel like this, her shooting through the floor must have seemed way cooler in the imagination. Whereas in real life, I'm sure they tried their best to make it look cool, but it just looks like she's just pointing her guns down. Okay, I give up. Ha ha. Whoa. Hello, Michael. In the most extra extra and dramatic way possible. Again, that the melodrama part of it does come out in performance decisions, I think, on behalf of like most actors, not just Bill Nye and Michael yes. Sheehan, where there seems to be a thing that happens in this movie where um, the characters, every behavior or action they have, it's like, the actors are committed to performing it in such a way where they are performing the like platonic ideal of whatever that fucking behavior they're doing is instead of just doing it in front of a camera. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when he's like, I'm going to say hello, Michael, he's like doing it in the way in a platonic like essence to capture that moment. You know what I mean? And that's something that is reminiscent of melodrama to me because it's like, it's like they're performing these different beats Instead of just doing them. Oh, look at this. Oh, yeah. He's Shirtless expel, regeneration. Expel the foreign objects from his body. That's so impressive. It is so impressive. I just don't know why. Like, I mean, it looks great, but. I don't know. <laughs> he's cleansing his pores. He's a good facial rub. <laughs> Maybe get some of that green stuff that was on his chest for some reason. Oh, he's a goop? He's a goop wolf? <laughs> he's a crust wolf. A goop werewolf. I should have never ta taught you. <laughs> there are a lot of things I should have never taught you, but it's too late for that now. Oh, here we have the uh, obligatory running after the car scene. This is where the action starts to feel really perfunctory to me. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, he's running after the car. Oh, look how fast he's going. That's cool. But then it's like... He's going to hop on here, and then what's going to happen? Oh, he's just going to punch through he's it. He's going to do the classic uh, bad slasher movie move of stab in the middle of the car. Yes. Um, I was just thinking about this the other day where, like, I realized, like, I'm never going to accept this in a movie again. Yeah. Where it's like, you know what? It really does make no fucking sense whatsoever just to stab in the middle of the car. Like, what are you doing? That's like false drama. You know, Max? Yeah. It's like a lie. Look how dramatic that was when he, he got was knocked off He the was car. like looking directly into the camera. <laughs> just like, yeah, fucking shit, right? This is a perfect example of that style of performance, right? He's performing the platonic ideal of when the character gets knocked off the top of the car. <laughs> and then they're about to get run over. Oh, man. And then again, like he gets up. He's just like, uh, and then... <laughs> And he just lands on his feet. Yeah. It's very extra. What? Did it's you just get extra. tired? You caught up to the car by. And again, this is what we say when we mean that it's into the aesthetic where like, it seems to understand that it should have an action chase sequence where he chases the car. But when you really think about it, all he needed w was the blood, which he already had. Yes. So why did he do any of that? I mean, I guess he wanted to stab her. He wanted to take Michael if possible, but like, it wasn't necessary. So he could have just left. But also his plan, as we learn later on, like depends on Michael becoming a cute, like, or just like, a hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. But my point is, if we cut out that, all of that, and he just left after the elevator and we just cut to them driving, you actually lose absolutely nothing. True, but also you have no idea what the fuck he's doing when he like does a thing with the capsule and his whatnot. I remember always thinking like, oh, is that like a thing to help push the silver out of his body? I mean, technically, we don't know what he's doing. Yeah. 
until he explains it. But you could, you could have like cut out the whole thing of him chasing after the car. No, we get nothing, but then we don't get the crash scene. But even this is, this sort of come later after we learn Michael's backstory. Really? The thing is like, there are ways to be way more economical about everything that's happening. She could have gotten bitten by werewolf in the hallway. Yes. Um, like, cause after we learned that like his first love interest died in a car crash, like put this later in the movie after they get to know each other a little more. And then it's him being like, yes, I finally got to make up for my past and she learns to trust again. Yeah. So we get two character things slightly built on, but at this point, neither of these people know each other. And because of that, Michael, I still don't care about him for the rest of the movie. And Celine is a vampire and I didn't know that she could drown or be affected by stab wounds that badly. Yeah. It just makes her seem kind of like weak. Which is weird because she seemed like an indestructible badass up until this point. But also that is something else that I sort of associate with. And this is more specific than melodrama as well. And we've gone back and forth about what the proper term to describe this is. But the idea of comparing this to a, a type of storytelling that is maybe comparable to like a young adult thing or like um, soap opera e, right? Where it's not just about performances that are over exaggerated and um, bordering on like histrionic at different moments for literally every moment <laughs> of the script. But it's also like very exaggerated performances of like characters like interacting in moments of extreme vulnerability, right? So this movie is going to emphasize when Celine is extremely vulnerable to build up the relationship because they were vulnerable with each other. Yeah. And she, he saved her. And another interesting thing just to go, just before we get too far from that moment when they were under the pier, I do really like that location though. And I feel like this movie does a pretty solid job of moving these characters through like neglected, empty peripheral spaces. Obviously the werewolves come to occupy that quite a bit more. And that again has to do with more of their like, I don't know, class associations that come with the werewolves. Um, But I do think this movie makes great use of the whole like marginalized peripheral areas that uh, we talk a lot about in our Hellboy commentary, but I feel like it's kind of similar all these movies use subways and sewers and abandoned buildings under piers. Yeah. Yeah. And this movie is, uh, I think pretty much, I think it's pretty successful at doing that. That's something that I think it's, it's solid with. It's one of those things where I just, it's just like, I'm not sure whether it's aware it's doing that or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm not sure if it's doing that because like, Celine isn't an out, she's an outsider in the fact that like, she doesn't fit in with like the, stupid aristocracy of the ones but like she doesn't act like them she doesn't act like them but like she's of them though yes it doesn't feel like the movie necessarily uses those locations as intelligently as hellboy or something like that no no and definitely if you compare this to hellboy that's like a major difference in terms of like vision and confidence in how that plays a role in the fuck you don't even have to compare it to hellboy you can compare it to blade 2 yeah. Even closer comparison. Whereas Blade 2, a lot of people like that more than Blade 1. I'm not myself included. so sure I agree. I think like the thing that you cannot deny, though, is that Blade that's w- the difference that a, like vision and confidence makes. Blade 1 is campy and silly. Um, Blade 1 has the best line in film history. Yeah. Hold on. Pause for one second. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. And we're back after hearing that amazing line. I'm just going to drop it right in, in there for everybody. Okay. Because I can't even if say my, it. If the sound of my eyes rolling <laughs> didn't block that out. Oh, now he's extremely vulnerable, Max. Look. Yeah. So this is the... It ten- feels like we missed a scene there. Like... What do you think we're missing? Well, because like he was caring after for her and then like, and then he's like in a coma. Yeah. Cause of the werewolf bite supposedly, but it's funny that she wakes up and then he goes to sleep. Yeah. But it is that thing where it's like, there's like that young adult, very extra angsty energy about this where it's like, she's vulnerable and then he's vulnerable and they have a connection and they're going to fight against the, the power against Craven 
Which honestly, he's just a cartoon character. He's just way too easy to hate. Yeah. They should have little subtlety with Craven's part. Yeah. It would have been nicer if he pr- demonstrated more competence. It's like ostensibly this guy. He barely has like any control over anybody in the house. Like, yeah. If, or like, even like if he was like this, have Celine, have like the other vampires like actually fear him besides girl who wants to fuck him really badly. You know, what's interesting about you saying that is that I'm now realizing not only do humans not exist aside from the handful of vampires and characters (laughs) we get, no other vampires or werewolves also exist either. You see them there. Yeah. <laughs> they don't really exist, Max. They're they're not relevant here. No. It's only these people. It's only this group of people. And then everyone else there, it's like they don't, they're not they're card- they're just invisible. They're literally cardboard cutouts they put in the background. Yeah, that are moving around and they're puppeteering them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, that's really why, maybe again, going back to what you said about Vampire the Masquerade, it doesn't seem like there's any sort of group or community there. It's just these characters. And then like which is like if you ever, if I can make a uh, video game recommendation to any of our listeners, play Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. It's one of the best games ever made. But oh the, my god, I'm gonna lo- love love this moment where he jumps out of a fucking fourth story <laughs> window or whatever. He's fine though. He's getting uh, flashbacks to two movies from now. He, you but, know, he. I'm sorry to interrupt you just before I forget this. This is the second moment where he's ex- like demonstrated extreme like awareness of his surroundings incompetency in high stress situations. The first one is when he knew to take the gun from Kate Beckinsale and shoot through the fucking glass. Yeah. When he was being abducted and there were werewolves, but then also he wakes up and then a woman jumps on the ceiling and then hisses at him like a cat. And then he's like, you know what? I should go. And he jumps out the window and then he vaults over a giant fucking fence with spikes on the top to escape like vampire dogs. (laughs) Yes. Hellhounds. (laughs) Leave us. So I can slap her, which I also just don't buy this character moment. If you wanted to humiliate her, I get, I don't, who cares? it doesn't logically make sense though. Right? Like we have that moment. It's like, wait, there aren't, aren't going to chase after him. No. Right. But it's because this movie emphasizes character interaction over everything, especially since, well, I guess it makes sense for Craven because like any scratching on the surface would realize that he's been working with the Lycans the entire time. Which is also why the character at the expense of everything is something you can point out about this movie because it's like the moment you start to think about anything, you're like, how the fuck did they not figure this out sooner? <laughs> oh, shooting the busts. Oh my God, it's stupid and I love it. This is again another instance of like, the connection maybe to that type of espionage type movie. There's similarities maybe between this and like James Bond, James Bond type scenes, you know, armory scenes. You also get those in blade a little bit, but definitely there's a part of this cycle of vampire movies where it really like indulges in the technological integration of like the vampire mythology. Yeah. Can I go back to, (laughs) Oh, fuck. Well, what were you I, saying? I forgot what I was saying about Vampire the Masquerade. But, uh, Bloodlines. Yes, well, it's still the greatest game of all time. But the sense of community that, like, is built in there, like, you you see how humans, like... Because the, the whole thing for the Masquerade in that stands for humans not knowing that vampires exist. And a big part of the game is if you break the masquerade five times in the playthrough, no matter what you it's game over, start again from the beginning. This is a dozens of hours long RPG. Um, but it's about the community that you build with your different clans of vampires, vampires as a whole humans that know about vampires existing, but like are okay with it. And as long as they get favors and it's like this whole believable network that makes like the entire city feel alive. Whereas this is just like, as you pointed out, there's, there's three werewolves, three vampires and a guy. And that's the entire thing. And I don't like, it doesn't feel like a world. I don't buy This like feels like a stage play. (laughs) Yeah. The only consequences of anything that happens are just emotional consequences and damage for these several people involved. Yes. And damage to buildings that were already falling apart. Yeah. That's one. That's all it is. That's entirely what it is. And the fourth movie tries to rectify that with the fact that vampires supposedly found out about humans and like had them eradicated. But uh, 
or vice versa, humans found out about vampires to had them eradicated. But then it just turns out to have been the lichens the whole time. And it was dumb. So wait, then the humans didn't know? They did, but like the lichens were basically like took control of a big company that controls the world now. The fourth one. Oh, so the lichens became the technocratic corporate overlords. It was stupid. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, really, I think it is, you can surmise this movie's pitfalls in that area as just saying that it's interested in melodrama character dynamics at the expense of everything. Like why the fuck did she have to kick open that door? Uh, because why the fuck wouldn't you? Because aesthetic. Yeah. And I'm okay with that, but it does stop the movie from being like maybe better. <laughs> maybe, you know, like a, a, a good movie would be. I just, the thing is, if you're going to just have that, it needs to be more invested in, in the aesthetic and it needs to be slightly shorter. Oh, what did Roger Ebert say about this movie? Cause oh my God. What the fuck did he say? Um, well, he gave it two stars. I know that, but I just want to make sure I get the quote right. I have it saved. Um, he was quoting uh, Brendan Gill, who used to be a writer for The New Yorker, who said that his definition for a porno, yeah, a porno film was a movie where you become acutely aware that the characters are spending too much time getting in and out of cars and walking in and out of doors. And that Underworld uh, is a movie that you realize that there's too many times yeah, characters going in and out of doors <laughs> and in and out of cars in a movie about werewolves and vampires, which is very true. Like there's so much superfluous stuff here. And like, I, I'm a slut for lore. I love that stuff. But like, what are we getting? We're getting the backstory. (sighs) Ostensibly what this should be is that she's consulting like the archives or whatever. And then she's learning that like, Oh, history is discursive. Oh my God. It's constructed information that's influenced by ideology and, yeah. And forces seeking to control things. It's part of an institution, Max. And of course, the slave mark is, you know, obviously there's, you know, racial implications about the difference here. Um, very convenient that his face was just torn out of this book. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> um, that's just another thing where it's like, hey, Lucian, she it- didn't recognize him. No, she never knew him. The timeline of this movie is very bizarre. She yeah. never knew him, but that was also something in the me- medieval time, which is where she's from. Yes, but because she- they killed her parents. Yeah, but not Lucian. Well, so she basically the only reason she was spared was because um, Victor had like just killed his daughter because his daughter had fucked Lucian. Yeah, in um, a replacement. Yes, and yeah, he felt bad and was like, I need a new daughter. Now, here's the other weird thing. How old was she when her family got slaughtered? Kate Beckinsale age. So So the same age? Yes. Okay. Because we were like, was she like a girl and then they waited until she was like hot Kate Beckinsale age? No, that was like her husband. (sighs) It's confusing. Yeah. And then this scene seems in here almost exclusively just to be like... Like why the movie is insisting that we take this seriously as if we care, but it's like, we, why do I care? I know there's nothing about this that yeah. I like understand or know. No, Michael is so fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's like astounding how boring he is. What else is, I, cause I've looked up what other actors, but there's a lot of big name actors in this movie or not a lot, but like people, they're character actors and they would go on to do a lot more stuff, but like, Michael, what do you do with your life? Are you in body spray ads or did you outgrow that? He's in that teen swimmer sex boy witch movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, that you told me about. <laughs> um, oh, now I've forgotten the name. Again. Covenant? Covenant. There we go. Fucking. Uh, yeah, we remembered that or I remembered that movie on watching this. That movie is. That shot is just from the Matrix. This is just from the Matrix. Oh, here come the cops. Run out the window. Your friend's a fucking narc. <laughs> Wentworth Miller, you fucking narc. You J.J. Abrams looking motherfucker. Oh, he's been on a uh, Grey's Anatomy. Um, oh, that makes so much sense. And he was also in a triple X State of the Union. Whoa. Love that one. Is that the one with Ice Cube? Probably. 
I don't. I haven't seen any of them. Well, we're going back into the triple X cinematic universe, and then this is just like at this point, you're just like, what? What is going on? This is a, a total innovation from the vampire stuff. Is the weird mirror, not tel- telepathy, but like communing voicemail. She's leaving a voicemail for him so that he understands everything, right? That's what she's going to do. She's going to feed him her blood, right? And there's this weird, like, transitive thing in this movie where when you exchange bodily fluids somehow... You you, get memories. Which is also connected to Hellboy, maybe, which Hellboy does more intelligently with the sense memory, the cultural history that Abe Sapien has, um, where you inherit the cultural history of this... Uh, which is also something that is, you know, it's a like a tie to race, right? To to be part of the vampire or lichen race is to have access to that cultural history. And something that I do think that's interesting about this movie, even though it does it kind of sloppy, no. is how it is about like the battling of different versions of history and cultural histories where like we see the vampire one is dominating at this point. But the arc of this movie is the revelation of the real Yes. history at play but also that's another thing that they took directly from vampire the masquerade and did more sloppily the ability does vampire the masquerade have va- uh werewolves yes um well there was another game that made by the same company about werewolves but it, it's not nearly as popular and basically nobody played it what was it called uh, werewolves the reckoning i think i, I can't remember um no, it they they all exist in the same universe type thing. Um, but werewolves are much rarer than vampires in the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're basically like incredibly dangerous and utterly terrifying, and nobody really wants to be near them. So they tend to just kind of stick to the woods and the wilds. And they're individuals. Yeah. Yeah. And before we get too far from that, I did find a a neat essay researching for this movie uh, that I just want to mention real quick called Sullied Blood, Semen, and Skin, Vampires and the Specter of Miscegenation okay, by cool. Kimberly A. Froreich from the journal Gothic Studies, Max. Ooh. Um, but it is a neat essay, and it talks about several different vampire fictions in this sort of cycle and talks about really cogently, I think about the way in which it is about miscegenation and like anxiety over that is something that is something that's been at play a lot in vampire books, movies, whatever pop culture. Yeah. And, um, one quote that I want to mention right here is that she writes in other words, the film suggests the film being underworld, uh, that being part of a race involves sharing a common history one that in turn defines the racial group. While the Lycans are able to recruit humans to their cause, the vampire's genocide of the Lycans appears as a strategy to maintain their own version of history. Indeed, the vampire rulers limit the sharing of blood and thus history to themselves. The film therefore highlights how historical discourse is used to define the racial other through the falsification and erasure of past events or memories and the prevalence of white male history over the voices of the other. And I think it there does case, do that. There is a case to be made for that. Yeah. yeah. And it's um, a shame the movie isn't better. Yeah, I mean, it's not <laughs> nuanced yeah. or exciting, but it is doing that. And it's sloppy, but it's interested in, in that sort of dynamic. And it is interesting, too, how that essay also discusses the way in which that is inherently tied to the vampire's attempt to like police what they view as the sanctified like bodily boundaries. Right. Um, it's, it's very much, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you could also compare it to the Island of Dr. Uh, Island of lost souls. Yes. Another movie we've done, which is also very much about like the difference between like the monstrous or like sanctified human body, the acceptable human body. And, um, I think a really good example of the way this movie innovates with both vampire and werewolf stuff is that it repositions the vampire. You always seem to associate vampires with more aristocratic stuff right off the bat in a much more like explicitly like Marxist kind of way. But that seems to me more of a recent thing, whereas definitely in 1897 when Dracula was first published and when you see Dracula becoming a big thing in that Victorian time, he is definitely like a foreigner, non-white person. And the anxiety is like, 
about him integrating into the English society. He's buying property, Max. Oh my God. You know, he's going to integrate with our legal system and he's going to seduce our white women. I, I guess I get that. It's mainly because all the vampire stories I've read since then tend to take a slightly Marxist or aristocratic angle. Well, it to starts it. to focus on something other than that. Yeah. And I feel like maybe part of the um, Dracula thing as well with that too, is that he is an aristocrat, but also perhaps in a way that's like, it's racist towards Eastern Europe, European people in a way where I don't want to like make too many assumptions. Cause it's not like I'm an expert in this, but like it seems vaguely reminiscent to me of like, racism towards Jewish people by making them rich. Do you know what I mean? Well, the Eastern European thing, it's always been interesting because like, if you talk to like a lot of Slavic people aren't considered like European, even though it's like a continuous land mass. And yeah. because like, and because of that, like they're an other that's like to be doubly feared there because they're not like completely other. So it's, yeah. it's a weird thing thing with that whole history yeah it's it's a and the thing is it's definitely something that is defined and then redefined over and over again in reference to what is considered whiteness at that particular time right and the thing about dracula is he is kind of i mean maybe you could find scholars who could really pin down specific signifiers in the text to say like exactly what type of eastern european person he might have been in the imagination of you know, Bram Stoker, but he is kind of more nondescript in that way. So he's also just representing the essence of that. And, um, I think by this point in time, just over like a hundred years after the publication of Dracula, we've reached a point where like very, the vampires are very much not the non-white invader to the point where, it's like obvious. Obviously, these people are not the non-white people. These are the rich or aristocratic white people. That's what they are. They're literal slave owners. <laughs> and this whole thing is about them trying to put down a slave uprising. And also, they flip the, uh, the trope of the very sexually aggressive black man, right? Where, in this case, it's Michael Sheehan, not black. But he is that slave underclass, right? And what is the whole anxiety, Matt, Max? It's like, oh, Bill Nye is trying to prevent his daughter from having sex with him. <laughs> right? I guess, yeah. That is very much, in my mind, the same type of um, trope that you would see against, like, the monstrous sexuality of black men, right? Well, it's, it's depending on whether you want to see it as a race thing or a class thing or whatnot. But I mean, the movie yeah. is not necessarily focused enough to make it's the truly uh, coherent no, connections. No, it's, it's the other. Yeah, but it definitely utilizes both of those. It utilizes conventions of othering along both racial and class lines yeah. to set up the difference between both groups. Bill Nye. There he is. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> Wait, what the fuck was he in that we saw? I don't didn't know he the world's end oh right you're right Uh, that was a fun movie I mean not fun it was depressing as shit it's still a funny movie I thought you said it was 600 years can you imagine somebody saying that to you and you're just like pull over (laughs) (laughs) never mind (laughs) oh that makes sense now Oh, now I understand why that fucking guy bit me. He was a fucking lichen. <laughs> and that chick jumped onto the ceiling and I jumped out a window. Honestly, I'm glad you told me that because up until this point, I just thought I was fucking going insane. But uh, to just go off of that, it is also interesting that... um this movie is sort of trying to restage. It's like a repetition of history, basically Yeah. where now Michael is the monstrous body or the monstrous male sexuality. And Celine is the daughter that is going to turn her back on Bill Nye. And this time she's going to overcome him. Of course, again, it's slightly muddled because it's like, it's not quite the same because it's like, Michael is just a human. 
and humans are so non-existent here that we know that they are dismissed out of hand, but it's like, do the vampires like hate them in a genocidal way? The lichens? No, the humans. I don't think they just, I think they just view them as food at this point, but like we, we never get any, like that's literally just me inferring. We, like, we can only infer the most basic things about the way they treat humans here. And it's definitely not as malicious as the lichens, because otherwise they would try to kill humans too. Yeah. So it's like, what, 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 <laughs> what is the situation here? Um, and then Michael being the sort of hybrid between the two, the fact of mis- miscegenation like occurring, right, is the crux of this movie, where it's like his hybrid ability does give him like magical superpowers or whatever. And um, once again, Bill Nye is trying to prevent the mixing of the two bloodlines because he's all about his like white supremacist blood blood purity test, right? So that's his whole thing. Again, racial dynamics are at the heart of this movie. I think it's also interesting that... We, <laughs> what the fuck is what? Discount Dakota Fanning doing? Like, uh, I just don't under... This is a part where like... Wait, what is going on right now? He's he's complaining because he, he's going to find out that... When they, he says it's time, I filled you in on a few things. It's this... The back and forth, like drama of this is so confusing because it's like they forget everything that happens outside of the scenes where it's happening and he's like it's time I let you in on a few things it's like so now is she in on the plot to like coordinate with Lucian yeah or what and then she like betrays him later for her own gain and it's like but what's her fucking goal Her she betrays him literally because she's a petty bitch and realizes that he'll never Stop wanting to fuck Celine. That's literally... Which is also poorly established. I remember watching this for for the first time to, like, review for the show. And then there's a scene later where, like, Celine bitch slaps him. And he's like, this is embarrassing. I had plans for us. And it's like, what? (laughs) Fuck you. You've just been shouting at her this whole time. I thought you hated her. (laughs) Also, I don't want to nitpick, but it is starting to irritate me how much Kate Beckinsale is walking around with her gun out. Yeah. Holster it. Holster your damn gun. Holsters can still look sexy. You can still wear the really sexy like spandex outfit and then the boots. Yeah. So they have cloned blood. So they they literally have no reason to care about humans at all. Yeah. That's like the screenwriter literally being like, oh, why do we care? Why, why haven't humans? So their motivation is just that they're racist. Yes. Yeah. See, if, if this guy was really like a cool protagonist guy, Michael, he'd be like, so you're racist. And then you want to hear all these vampires, like give some sort of excuses about like, well, you know, well, Kate back in the sales, just like, oh, they killed my family and that silences him. But, and, uh, Here we yeah, see, we get this scene. <laughs> Do you feel like this movie really grapples with the fact that they're like committing genocide? No. It it wants to be about race, but I also do feel like it kind of misses the fact that it's like genocide is the word. It's like she's committing genocide. <laughs> Our hero is committing genocide, everybody. Okay, so she was a 20-something, live, still living with her parents in medieval. As you do. That's not... Don't shame people for doing that. Whatever. I didn't... I just... I'm surprised her parents lived to lived long enough in medieval times to be that old. They live fucking longer than we do now, Max, in America. Did you see that article from last year about, like... People saying like, 
oh, did you know like serfs had more free time than people in the U.S.? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, but serfs were tied to the land that they were born on and could never... Oh, wait, most people can't afford to move out of their home state. Uh, Unless they go to Wisconsin. And that's never... Don't ever go to Wisconsin. Let's go to Milwaukee. No, don't ever go to Milwaukee. That's how they get you. I've never looked back. You know what else is interesting that I kind of noticed about for this? For 600 years. Yeah, for I've 600 never years. never once questioned anything. I've never but then thought this <laughs> hot guy showed up and I'm like, hmm. Hmm. Maybe the first hot guy I've seen <laughs> in 600 years. Maybe. I mean, if all she's seen is like big dog people in the same cardboard cutouts in the mansion, <laughs> plus Craven, like maybe killing lichens is the only good thing she has to do. Oh yeah. The one other thing I wanted to mention is, um, uh, that's a weird fucking edit. Why the fuck did we edit out of this conversation to them talking about whatever to Lucian and the doctor? And then we're going to go back. There's so many times this movie does this where it cuts in and out between two scenes. It's like, just let the scene happen. <sighs> this is where I don't understand. It's because the guy directed music videos and like, I, I, I mean, I don't know. There are a number of different ways. Maybe it could be an editor trying to like salvage the movie or improve the pacing. Maybe, Maybe the editor is not. Maybe the scene. Yeah, maybe each of these scenes went on for like way too fucking long. So he's like, maybe if I splice them together, it will like sort of take the burden off your shoulders. We were like, oh, something new. Okay. Yeah. But also it's just like, what? You're watching it and it's just kind of. It's jarring. (laughs) Michael, stop talking. I don't care about you. Oh my gosh. This editor is totally involved in this aesthetic. But you know what else he's done is Full Metal Jacket, Event Horizon. Mortal Kombat and the Chronicles of Riddick. Uh, no, but like, oh, he got his degree. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> That's what we know about him. Bachelors of Science. But then on in the train station. The fuck? You haven't moved on 600 years and you're asking if this guy has moved on? Also, 600 years is like a really fucking long time. Yeah. How do you get really bored? How do you like... I, I mean... I'm just going to show my naivety here, but like you're a vampire. How do you get like, how do you stay like so genocidally racist for 600? Don't you get even just get like a little bit bored and then start to question it? Imagine having like, didn't you like, didn't you have like a fine art phase where you were just like, (laughs) I'm immortal. I'm going to spend a hundred years like getting really good at like painting abstract paintings or something. Didn't you have a not goth phase? Yeah. My vampire friends. I want to be like the best clown in history. I'm just going to study clowning. You want to learn how to juggle? Yeah. You went to mime school. <laughs> for and then a- Bill Nye got real mad at you. <laughs> for a hundred years. That is not a good degree. <laughs> we find that out in Underworld 6. So that's the real reason she's so angry. Is that. With- <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't let her be a mime. <laughs> the next movie is just her with like the mime face makeup on. Why and then not? people try to ask her for exposition and then she just like shrugs her shoulders and it's like, I don't know. I'm a mime. Uh, these char- so dramatic. These characters have no chemistry. No, they, they kind of don't. Um, and then you really objected to this comparison, but I said this, this movie kind of had like theater kid energy. I, it's just one I spent a lot of time with theater kid techies, not the actors. So like my perception of theater kids is slightly things, but like, I guess like go on with what you mean by that. And I'll, what I mean is not that they would like it necessarily, but that it is the same energy. 
It's like, can you imagine being in a room or a bus with these people for like four hours while they sing like show tunes? Not even sing show tunes. Just like, even though she's the main character, like Kate Beckinsale, I feel would be insufferable to be around for. But in a theater kid way, like they're the bad part of theater kids. Oh, look at this incredibly erotic sex scene. They're not even like having (laughs) sex. (laughs) She's dancing toplessly around him. They're just like music video having sex. (laughs) It's like the director did music videos before. He's still wearing all his clothes. (laughs) That's how vampires have sex. See, that's not a problem in Vampire the Masquerade. It's because vampires like explicitly can't have sex. So (laughs) you don't have to worry about that. Why? Is that the one thing that answers like, how do they get hard? If yeah. they don't have blood or whatever. Yeah, they don't have blood flow <laughs> through their system. Well, they must have blood thro- flow. Oh, who fucking cares? Yeah. Who cares? But at that point, it's like, why do you want to be a vampire? And you're going to live for like a thousand plus years and then never have sex? What the fuck? I mean, you can. It's just hard, apparently. And I mean, listen, I wouldn't judge anybody. Yeah. But also, like, that sounds like not the most amount of fun. Oh, look at that phone. <sighs> But vampires definitely do fucking this. <laughs> what? <laughs> his fucking face. His upset face. It's just that he wasn't having sex. He still has his pants on. I know. He's <sighs> just. It's just very bizarre. Oh, here's that moment where he, she, she's going to slap him finally. How could you do this to me? <laughs> it's so embarrassing. God, why did you do that? So one thing I was going to mention earlier um, is that uh, something I've noticed is that I think the idea of like (laughs) the inaccessible leader is like a trope for like dystopic authoritarian fiction as well, where you have this inaccessible leader who's kind of like also their image of them is like a facade. This moment is so stupid. The door closes on him and then he's like, fuck. It's like, can you just open the door? Yeah. Can you just tell the door guard guy to, or is he just like, nope. Sorry. I only pressed the button once. <laughs> Not my pay grade, man. Yeah. You only gave me one bag of blood. I asked for the raise to two, and maybe if you had done that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have joined the vampire union. But <laughs> How many years of being undead do you have to experience before you're... Oh, you just made the noise. I love the Bill Nye noises. Oh. Oh. I prefer his squid noises. <laughs> it's the Caribbean. <laughs> Oh, he just kicked him out. Yeah, that's why you need to be union. If you union, know what? <laughs> file a complaint about that. That guy gets the short end of the stick way too much. Earlier, when when we didn't point it out, but when Celine wakes up Victor, she just gives him the dumbest fucking... She's like, what does Craven want to? Mm. And he's like... <sighs> and he just gets up from his desk and then he leaves. It's like... Also, like, do you think when he was like... I know this is like a really important scene and whatnot but like do you think when that guy got turned immortal he's just like oh my god i have all of eternity to do whatever i want i'm gonna be a non-stop killing machine he got a fucking desk job watching security cameras and pressing a button to open a chamber that only opens once every hundred years yeah meanwhile everyone else they're the people who get to wear the like the liberace <laughs> yeah, vampire ch- shirts chain smoke in one room of a mansion all day and he just sits alone playing like candy crush And then they introduce this whole concept of like, some of us are sleeping and then others are awake. And it's like, oh, he just made another noise. I love the Bill Nye noises. The like them. He's going to reprimand her. But, um, yeah. Uh, we, here we have, this is like the first real character moment for Kate Beckinsale in this movie. It's like the first time something's kind of like changing about her, even though I feel like they didn't really, they didn't really like establish her like relationship with Victor super well. 
No, we know that she trusts him, but it's mainly used as an excuse for her not to listen to Craven constantly. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to say that this is actually a strength of performance for both her and Bill Nye in the scene, because I feel like this scene really does communicate the father daughter, father daughter relationship in a way that's kind of missing from the earlier exposition. Yeah. I think it does kind of sell it in a way that um, maybe it doesn't sort of communicate on paper. My DVD copy of the covenant. I liked those boy, shirtless boys. I just woke Nobody up. Nobody saw that movie. I, I woke up for the first time in a century. DVDs are new to me. It was the first movie I wanted to watch. You know what? I hate the way the actor that does Craven, the way he walks <laughs> with like his head hunched forward. Yeah. It's like, you are not intense. You're just, you, you're low on vitamin D. Oh my God. Um. <laughs> God, his face is just like, oh fuck, she knows. Oh God. Oh no. <laughs> oh fuck. I got a pen mark. She knows my tattoo isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> I just drew it on. Yeah, that's literally why she betrays him. Well, now we know that. But also then it's like, just establish it sooner. I just want to know, understand. So you're a hierarchy. He's an elder who sits in the basement, Bill Nye. But then who's the king? Why wasn't there an elder awake? I thought one of them was supposed to be awake. At all times, yeah. And it sort of seems like, I don't know. I feel like they needed to do a better job like establishing the dysfunction. It seems like it should be a weird, as far as Kate Beckinsale's character is concerned, like a, um, that's a terrible idea, by the way. At least it didn't work. He was like, statistically, he's way more likely to accidentally kill himself than actually like shoot through the chains he's chained up in. Um, but no, they, I feel like what it should be with the Kate Beckinsale character is like a Telemachus slash Hamlet situation at the start of their stories where like Telemachus is like my dad Odysseus he's gone and there's all these people like trying to fucking hit on my mom fuck my mom and eat my food yeah <laughs> this is so irritating um and then Hamlet is like my fucking uncle is like fucking, fucking my mom <laughs> right? my dead dad might have told me to kill to, my uncle yeah I might be going insane who knows <laughs> Um, I get a tweet about it. Um, I'm sorry, but like now that I'm thinking of desk job guy, I'm just thinking of like all these vampires who get like the I boring get, jobs. I get to be immortal and be flashlight guy. But also that flashlight guy is about to get slaughtered. Yeah. Oh wait, no, that was, oh, who fucking cares? I'm more interested in what fucking train station this is. It's vampire train station. I don't think you can like hide a train station from the public because train stations have like no but train rails right and it's like okay so the rail is going to lead all across all over the place unless it just goes like straight into the woods and there's like no one near them <laughs> and it's stuff like this when you see like how have, I guess because their numbers are so low but like there was like less werewolves than there were heavily armed security guards there. And they just fucking decimated all of them. Yeah. They don't quite <laughs> like get the stakes across either. We know werewolves are scary because we know based, it's supposed to be based on what Kate Beckinsale's relationship to them when they're chasing her at the first scene is Yeah, to establish stakes and what they're capable of. But it doesn't really come across because at the same time, she's supposed to be like this avenging angel, like, Basic, basically like an AC-130 with like legs. Yeah. That's my impression. It's like werewolves don't want to go out in public because they're afraid of getting sniped by like the surveillance vampires. And also because, you know, they're gigantic. And they're very easy to pick out. Yeah. yeah. Um, but instead, the impression you get is kind of like nondescript about who's more dangerous. 
I think the movie wants you to believe that the werewolves are more physically dangerous. But also the werewolves have advanced technology that then they have to counter with, with their version of Q. Yeah, but he's, but then you find out that like they've been stealing that partially from the vampires with the help of Craven. And but then the vampires, I thought they invented it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It really does not matter. What is interesting to me, though, is, again, this is something that's germane to this cycle of vampire movies, is the way in which they they sort of transform mythology into biology and science. Yeah. Right? So it starts be it stops being less like curse magical stuff. That's something they took more from Blade than they did a uh, Vampire the Masquerade. Sure. Um, um Vampire the Masquerade it, like dates back to the Bible, but yeah. And uh you know that It's be- interesting. I think it works well here where you have like this this vampire society that I think is vaguely fascistic in a lot of its characteristics, that's something that we haven't commented on yet, is that there's certain moments of this movie where it takes advantage of um, set design, I think, in a very intelligent way, where it's like, it reveals that gothic architecture if you strip away some of the, like, bells and whistles and the frills, and it becomes just kind of, like, large and looming and intimidating. It's like, it kind of just looks like fascist architecture. Yeah. And it's almost like, oh, that really meshes well with this, like, New World Order, like, vampire dystopia society that's controlling everything. Um, and it, it it's interesting because it just comments on the tradition that it grew out of in a way that I think is smart and creative. Um, but also, like, there's other fascistic things in here. I feel like the vampires kind of have, like, Hugo Boss-esque outfits, maybe. Um, I know that the leather and spandex stuff is definitely also, again, part of this whole, like, cycle of 90s movies you know, going back to stuff like The Crow or whatever, right? But here it definitely seems to feel a little bit more reminiscent of, you know, Nazi garb, maybe. And uh, and I think uh, the, the way in which they transform, like, the magical properties of vampirism and lichenism in this into something that's like viral and can be quantified and then evaluated for like whether it's worthwhile, it should exist or be eliminated is something that is like, it it reminds me of like eugenicists in a way that also reminds me of fascists. I mean, the doctor that's working for the werewolves definitely kind of gives me like weird. I mean, he's supposed to, he's working in like a disgusting saw laboratory. Right. But like, he gives me like disgusting eugenicist. Like I need to build the perfect specimen. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I think, I think it's natural that these types of vampire movies also deal with totalitarian institutions and then also eugenics because that's what they're transforming it into. Right. Oh, they have genuine like blood packs exploding out of these people. That's cool. This is a fact no one will care about whatsoever, but if you pay attention to some of those werewolf guns, you'll notice that they're the same exact model of gun that they whip out in Alien vs. Predator. They were really for advertising at that time. Do you ever think about that, that a lot of guns used in movies are just as much product placement? Oh, for sure. People are falling out of windows so much in this movie. Well, it's to show like how indestructible and whatnot they are. But like the problem is we don't have any human characters. To oh my f- God, the cops. Yeah. You well, spoke at the wrong moment, Max, because these are very important cops. We don't know if they're human though. No, we don't. Is there anything that even demonstrates they're really real? <laughs> they're hallucinations the entire time. Between him and Wentworth Miller. What if they're just like here to arrest him for something completely different? We actually think you were involved in that shootout in the subway. But, but it's so weird because it's like, that's not how cops arrest people. They don't like throw them into the back of the trunk before like handcuffing them. <laughs> that's not how that happens. No, they clearly work for somebody. But, but who? Exactly. Well, it doesn't matter because like Craven and Lucian are theoretically on the same side. So, but 
I'm assuming Lucian at this point, because that's where he ends up. Yeah, I don't know. That's the other thing that was unclear to me during the prep screening is like, okay, we... Oh, yeah, it is Lucian, because those people were werewolves. That's why they were affected by the silver bullets, but... No, those were the people in assaulting the building. Yeah, those they were werewolves. Are the the cops are werewolves? At least they at least work for the werewolves. You know what? I'm okay. done arguing about it. I am going to just concede that you're right. I think you're right, Max. Well, because she comes back with the scientist guy for Victor. But we're, right, doesn't right doesn't he escape? I thought Michael escapes and then like explodes out of the car. He's going to, yes, but I'm saying, like, right now. You know what? These practical werewolves are fun. I, mean, I like them. They're definitely patched up with CG, but, yeah, no, when you get closes up on their faces or their talons, I really like it. And he's going to extract more magical blood or whatever. <laughs> Is that one movie they did on... Best of the worst, where it's just uh, the Captain America, the 90s one starring uh, J.D. Salinger's kid, oh. where he kept getting like he his keeps, super like stealing cars from <laughs> innocent people. But I think I'm going to be sick. Can you pull the car over? I need to pee. <laughs> what if he just did that here? Can you get cops pull over? I think I'm going to be sick. Yeah. Oh, he got us. He's <laughs> running away. Darn. This is the weird thing, too. He's transforming into a lichen. But then also, like, I thought it, the moon didn't matter. Maybe the first time it matters. Yeah. Well, I guess Lucian said the first time after he bit him, he's just like, the full moon's in two days. He'll be lichen soon enough. So I'm assuming, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> Here, let me give you some jam out music for that, man. Listen, I don't want to overestimate cops, but these aren't American cops. They would have shot him by now. No, they would never shoot a white person. <laughs> but it's like, what? He's going to escape right now. This is so confusing to me. I know this must be like ripping to listen to us just being like, what? Who? What? Who's going on? This movie what? does get worse in the second half, unfortunately. Because um, it's just like you start feeling how long it is. Because it feels like once Victor's woken up and once like Craven's plan starts falling apart, like narratively, you're just okay, like. These guys are definitely not just cops. Yeah. No. Otherwise, why does he? What's we knew that already. For? They're working for somebody. It was just a matter of who. But. Because narratively, like, you feel once, like, Victor's been awakened and Craven's plan starts to fall apart, like, narratively it should be, like, coming to a head, but now... We get more drama. Yes. And there's just way too many scenes, to go back to that <laughs> Roger Ebert thing, there's too many scenes of them just, like, sitting doing nothing, and yeah. then <laughs> someone gives them news and they're like, damn it! It's like, shouldn't you be doing something? And we got, we had like eight reaction shots there of like cigarette, his face, her face, <laughs> her cigarette, his cigarette, his face, her face. And it's just like, what the fuck, man? Oh, Bill Nye's got the bedazzled outfit now. I saw what you were wearing earlier. What the fuck was that? My Lord, you missed the sixties. You do not know what it was like. <laughs> Changed everything. <sighs> oh, she got the doctor. Yeah. Dr. Moreau. That's actually what I named my island in a Animal Crossing. Are you fucking serious? Yeah. Because so I'm, I'm a guy and I'm living a bunch amongst a bunch of animal people. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, it's Moreau. <laughs> Sounds like a good name for an island. Moreau's Island. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Max, I want to bring up cyborg manifesto manifesto for cyborgs okay do you remember the last time we talked about this um it was was it was it for uh fucking 
Um, Tetsuo. Yes, that's literally, yeah. I was thinking of the name, but that was in my head. In that, in that episode, we talked about a cyborg manifesto because it's this very important piece of criticism and kind of challenging to read for sure um, by Donna Haraway, uh, written in the 80s. And it's about exploring different ideas of identity, um, and, but also really establishing in that essay the idea of how the way the status quo, I don't know, institutions work and the way they sort of encourage identity is, works in like a dualistic binary between man and woman, right? And that's what she's talking about, is uh, talking about how identity can help disintegrate the binary because that's something that reinforces a current power structure, right? And in this movie, we sort of see similar things at play. Um, and uh, she sort of uses the idea of cyborg as an image, not necessarily literally, although in some cases literally, the idea that as we progress further into the future, the things that can be definitively called like real authentic humanity are going to change inevitably. And that can happen on a literal cyborg level, right? But also there's just synthetic things that are going on. Like, you know, maybe you could make an argument that people who need certain types of medication, that's a certain type of cyborg identity, right? Because you you are taking in something that is synthetic and now it is allowing you to embody yourself more fully. And that's not like a value judgment. That's just saying that like, that's a definition of humanity that's being expanded and it doesn't make you less valid as a human, but it's something that was not existent a hundred years ago. So she's talking about like growing ideas of identity and how it's going to evolve, hopefully out of the binary system. And that's sort of something that's going on in this movie with um, just the focus on blood and the technological sort of biological emphasis on it. Right. Right. Uh, I, I think the same thing is sort of happening in Blade where it's all about like trying to... Blade also definitely has the hybrid character, right? Blade himself, he's the daywalker, yeah. right? But it all has to do with birth and genetics and like alteration of your genetic code or whatever. And um, something that Haraway sort of talks about is the ambiguity of the changing identity in that sense, where we brought it up in Tetsuo because Tetsuo, it's simultaneously like this horrifying experience, or at least it alternates between something that's horrifying. And then our character, the fetishist starts to feel maybe more powerful and comfortable. And then by the end, it's like this weird collective, like political victory almost where it's like, we're going to fucking destroy everything. And they're like a giant tank. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and this, it's also sort of, something that seems to be ambiguous where it's like the technology and the way it's interacting with their idea of the legitimate human is, <laughs> I love how it's just like, boom. Yeah. He just, bugs bunny ran out of there. <laughs> Craven just disappears. There's like a cloud of dust behind him. But yeah, I think the way that the technology interacts with, no. <laughs> with everything is pretty ambiguous in this in the same way where like the werewolves use technology to try to break down the hybrid or break down the binary division between the two. And then the vampires use technology to try to uh, reinforce it. <laughs> Girl, you deserve better. No, she doesn't. She knows exactly what's going on and she's still like aiding and abetting them. I really, now that I think about it, I really am just like, you're like genocidal maniacs. You're all genocidal maniacs. Yeah. You're slave owners. <laughs> Bill Nye is a slave owner. This guy is getting a lot of mileage out of his yeah. like bulging, like expressionistic Peter Lorre eyes. <laughs> Bill Nye, abomination, right? He doesn't want the hybrid identity because he's racist. That's another really interesting thing from that essay I mentioned is that it actually references... Oh, okay, that's why. What? That, maybe? What? What are you talking about? So, I'm assuming Amelia, that chick was the elder that was currently awake? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's, they, they had their big, like, expo or conference or yeah. whatever. 
vamp expo. So she was going back to sleep and they were going to wake up the other one that wasn't Victor. I don't know. I thought it was like a truce alliance thing. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. Expl- That's what I'm saying where it's like as much as info dumps shouldn't be done in the beginning. There's a lot of stuff that I'm like, what the fuck? Like, it takes for granted that you know and understand. And yeah. then you're like, okay. Wait, who are these people? What? What? Ooh, he just fucking exploded his head with by punching him. Uh, sir, I could have shot him. But yeah, what was I about to say? Tetsuo society. No, I we was... live in a society. Mm-mm-mm. Oh, the thing I was going to mention that was interesting from that article I dug up is how it also references like old timey, like pseudo phrenology, pseudoscience from the 19th century. And, um, I think the term they used was like, hold on, let me find it. So the, the thing it talks about is monogenetic versus polygenetic. And that's a very interesting thing where they're referencing these old phrenologists, pseudoscientists from the 19th century, talking about how black people and white people literally evolved from different species. Uh, Right. And then there's the same thing here where they get the myth of like, or the story of like Mr. Coronavirus or whatever his name is with the two sons. And then one is a wolf and then one is a bat. And then it's like, then he's like, that's ridiculous. Of course, Bill Nye subscribes to the polygenetic theory, right? There is no similarity between me and those disgusting animals. But and of course, reality is. He knows, I think he knows it's true. It's just that. Yeah, it's just that he wants to see less of them because. He hates them and he's a genocidal maniac. Although even still, it's like, that's the weird thing about like the way people re- like always relate to animals too is like, okay, so that makes it okay. They look like us. They talk like uh, like us. They have slightly more hair, but still, we were okay to kill them because they're just not the same. It's so weird. It's such an arbitrary difference. Yeah. So you don't dress like an 18th century aristocrat in the middle of your house. I guess my question here is how is this going to bring an end to the conflict? So if they successfully create the hybrid. He's saying that from what the guy just said is that like Michael was basically like the mixing pot of it because his body allows like the things to mix. Yeah. So if he injects all the lichens with the basically the hybrid virus, whatever, they'll become immensely powerful and just be able to wipe the vampires off the earth. Yeah. I feel like that's part of the implication. Although I'm also not sure whether or not it's like, look, I'm going to show that we're actually kind of the same genetically. Well, I think that's the point too. It's like a moral victory against Victor of just like, look, Oh, look, it's not polygenetic. Yeah. It's monogenetic. We actually are the same. And it was okay that I fucked your daughter and we were going to have a child together. But then also like, the implication of that just seems like so like just like stupid. It's like, oh, you're telling me the racist genocidal maniacs are going to stop because you presented them with a rational. No, it's not. It's going to be a military victory, but it's also going to be like a fuck you. I was right in both ways. Victory. So Max, yes. Um, what's up? <laughs> so, uh, oh my God, stop! <laughs> I know it's just it just keeps editing back to it. One thing we didn't really finish our conversation about though was like depictions of werewolves and the sort of tradition of that. It's much less easy to comment on than vampires because werewolves have a much less like um, notable. Uh, history and fiction, I think. They go back very, very far. 
at least as far as vampires, as far as I know. Yeah. But if not farther, but like, there's just, there's no, like, there's not a lot of like central texts as far as like literature goes that contributes to like a, a werewolf mythos. Really? The first one is in Petronius Satyricon. There's like an episode where somebody describes it like a traveler who transforms into a wolf. Well, look, you can go back to like any amount of cultures that have like myths of, yeah, people turning into animals. Sure. Like it's the tale as old as time. But also like if you're trying to build like a core body of texts, like a canon, it's like you have, there's never one that's like explicitly just about that in the same way that Dracula is like building a canon for vampires, you know? Yeah. And then it takes really until the 20th century for it to really become a big thing. And I feel like more so than vampires, I feel like werewolf mythology has been much more informed by movies. Yeah. Well, cause the modern imagination of the werewolf is the wolf man. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I feel like the, uh, werewolf seems to, it seems that it also makes sense because it's like, Part of the spectacle of werewolves is the bodily transformation. Uh, I mean, that was perfected with American Werewolf in London. And right. But I mean, the fact of it happening in front of your eyes on film is a yeah. distinctly different thing than reading it in a way that I do not get the impression with like vampires, really. Like you see the similar things with vampires, like obviously in, in the original Dracula book, there's passages of describing him like similar or transforming to all sorts of different animals. Um, but it's not quite the same. Whereas the werewolf is like the transformation is a huge substantial part of that mythology. And it is going to have more of an impact when it's visual. At the very least, it does make sense to me here where, you know, the, the werewolves are taken to be more of the, um, underclass, because compared to the vampires who are already aristocratic, I think the emphasis on bodily transformation and just the body itself is something that like whiteness assigns to non-white communities, right? It's it's something that has to do with whiteness where like if you're going to separate one thing on white and the other thing on non-white, white is not something that has like – it distances itself from its own body, Right? Whereas non-white is more of the body. It's more bestial. It's more carnal. Yeah. Well, definitely Western. And if we're still uh, taking a racial approach to that, that's the thing though. Like that's why this movie, like it adapts a lot of tropes, but I don't think it's as intelligent to use them where it's like, we're just going to, I guess because Ray's is the only like non-white character like Ray's and the arms guy who we rarely ever see. Yeah. I mean, there's just, I don't know. A lot of the, a lot of the characters are so like nondescript is the thing. Especially this is probably the most, the, the worst example of it where we were watching this and we're just like, you know, it really occurred to us that as far as combat or anything goes, Vampires are just people. Yeah. They're just people with guns. And that's kind of disappointing. We're, you know, we don't get like turns into mists or bat things. We don't get like, yeah, there's nothing about them. That's vampiric that distinguishes them from the werewolves. And in, in this entire climactic sequ sequence, obviously we are sort of sympathetic to the idea that maybe it's hard to stage a sequence with a bunch of werewolf bodies jumping around. Yeah. But for this entire sequence, we're just going to see people shooting at each other. It's like, this is supposed to be the magical monster climax. This is your monster mash. It's just people with guns. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think this movie actually does innovate. More. What is the point of this? I know it's confusing. We don't know why Craven shoots Lucian here. Like, what is his plan? See, I really did kill Lucian this time, even though I lied about it the first time. Is he going to use that to make up for... But then he tries to escape anyway. It's so yeah. confusing. It's so baffling. Um, no, I was not expecting that because it makes no fucking sense at all. 
you stupid moron. <laughs> Uh, that's what I'm saying. This movie really emphasizes. Honestly, Craven didn't need to exist in this movie. If we just had like Celine left in charge by Victor and like she was carrying out the genocide of the werewolves. Yeah. And then she starts to have doubts. Yes. And just as she's about to like come around, that's when Victor gets woken back up. Yeah. I think I would prefer that as well. Um, Cause I feel like I would like to see Kate Beckinsale do more of that in this movie. I don't think she's like terrible. No. And I don't know what her performance like in the other ones, but like it reminds me of another movie she did immediately after this Van Helsing. Oh God. Which is also not a good movie, but her character is like decent (laughs) in it. She's like in Transylvania or whatever. And she's like the leader of the anti Dracula army. (laughs) And then the ADA. Yeah. (laughs) And then Van Helsing shows up and she's like, you're fucking everything up. That's their whole dynamic is like, you are fucking things up. Please stop. Please just go away. Um, and uh, it's interesting. It's interesting when she's in charge, right? I think it would have improved this movie. I think I agree with you. <laughs> also, like Scott, Scott Speedsman, I mean, he <sighs> does not have a lot to work with, but they, they just like put it set him up for failure when they just give him like constant like reaction shots it's like you can only act amazement so much they did it once in jurassic park they did it once that's all you have to do and also in jurassic park it was oh god it was genuinely amazing and it was delightful look it's a dinosaur and the music was more astonishing than anything honestly come on Ray's this point you're the only character alive that i still care about so okay that this is very weird did you hear that yeah as rays is going down the stairs they have a a stock sound effect that has only <laughs> ever been used oh god this location for, for fire being ignited as he's going down the stairs it's like what the fuck is that it's very bizarre oh here's the boss battle with no it's the mini boss halfway through the level which we haven't... Who the fuck is this guy? He's one of the death dealers, apparently. But I'm pretty sure we've not seen this. No, like, he might have been in the background of a scene. No, I don't think we've ever seen like him as a character before. But like, apparently the movie needed to be have one more fight scene. This test you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of that moment in House of Wax with the guy with like ping pong stuff. Yeah. It's like, look, he's got whips. The test audience has said that we needed another fight, so... I mean, I don't know. We can't get Kate back and sail back, so let's get a werewolf puppet and... I mean, I don't mind. It's just that... It's just like, why? What is going <laughs> I on? love how his stupid and practical weapon is like the reason he dies instantly. Is he gets caught in a rock. <laughs> it's like, you were real badass for two seconds. <laughs> yeah. And then you were fucked. You think all the other vampires told him that... They're like, dude, yeah, it looks cool, but like, what if it gets caught in something? He's like, nah, trust me, man, it's gonna be great. They're like, have you seen Indiana Jones <laughs> when the guy is like doing the cool thing with the sword and then he just shoots him? <laughs> you realize that like 90% of the time we're fighting werewolves, they're not in werewolf form, they're, yeah. they just shoot people. There's a lesson to be taken from that. <laughs> and it's don't be the guy who's waving a sword around and then just get shot. And he's still alive, surprisingly. chains so many chains not since hellraiser have there been so many wet dangling chains in a movie how do you think this looks i mean i think it looks fine i'm gonna get sick of these locations real quick it is starting to get a little bit samey at this point it's just a little bit too disorienting with the motivations and everything where it's just like, what's going on? I feel like I'm in pandemonium. <laughs> this is, this is what they, yeah, this is what they show you in pandemonium. It's just like, is this a, like what it's like to have coronavirus fever hallucinations? You're just like, where am I? There's vampires and werewolves and somebody here claims to be a male nurse. And Michael, <laughs> Michael's the most terrifying of all. He has no personality whatsoever. He's a fake human. 
Like, what is going on? I like the smoke. One other thing I didn't mention is that uh, Kate Beckinsale's outfit is actually, I mean, it's awesome, but also like, I love the aesthetic of like the vampire in spandex thing. It actually goes back much farther than like this nineties type aesthetic max. Does it? Um, it begins with a really fantastic French silent serial called Le Vampire by like Louis Fouillade. I think the guy's name is, um, he also did Fantomas, which is another really big serial from that time. Um, but it's a great silent serial about this woman vampire who dresses very similarly um, to this. And she's like also kind of like a thief criminal mastermind. Okay. Right. That'd make more sense. The fact that she's, her boots have high heels on them is ridiculous, but right. But it's part of that imagery. Um, And I think it's, I think it's just a really great look for that type of thing. I wish she was doing more like infiltration stuff, you know? Um, It's just really interesting. That original silent, Serial, by the way, is really great. Like, it's one of those silent things where it's like sometimes you see silent movies and you're like, I know that we are into movies, Max, but at the same time you watch it and you're like, wow, this would be so much fun for just everybody to watch. And I feel that way with both Phantom Us and... It's depressing uh, that there are some types of movies that like people just won't watch. Yeah, just because they won't give themselves the opportunity to enjoy it, even though it definitely seems like something that would be easy to get into for a lot of people. I mean, I get it. Another uh, vampire movie that really utilizes that aesthetic in a very, you know, self-aware way is a movie from the nineties called Irma Vep. Have you ever seen that? Uh, no, you're Olivier Sayas movie. You're that one's really fun. That's a really good one. That's that one is very like meta and self-aware. I mean, for modern vampire movies, there's always a girl walks home at night. But like, I wasn't the biggest fan of that. I know you weren't. But I was surprised to hear that. But I, I was, I was a rather big fan. If you're looking for a more contemporary movie to watch, I would recommend that one. Dracula 3D. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Drive Angry 3D. <laughs> the vampire <laughs> movie Drive Angry 3D. Although, let's be real, Nick Cage does have Vampire's Kiss, which is genuinely a good movie. Yes. Um, I mean, he also has a haunted house in New Orleans and a gigantic marble tombstone. Do you think he was goth growing up? I don't know. Well, he, maybe he was like a goth nerd because he also owns the first Superman comic and really wanted to be Superman. So like, yeah, you know, it's how- kind of hard to pin down what he must be like. I don't know, but definitely the haunted house thing in new Orleans. He must have an interest in this, in this sort of thing in the occult or something. Ow. Ooh, ripped up body parts. That hurt. What a fucking loser. <laughs> okay, time to go. Well, I'm gonna, no. Holster your fucking guns, people. I can't because we made a deal with whatever fucking gun company made this. that They have to be on screen for X amount of time for, to, to get the money. Again, another yeah. reaction shot. Why is he nervous that the werewolf is going to kill him? Yeah, Lucian himself is like, you're one of us now. Yeah, you are a werewolf. Yeah. she He hasn't been bitten yet by Kate. So he's just werewolf at this point. No, he was inject. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, so it works when Kate Beckinsale does it. Well, yeah. (laughs) Mike's just a fuck up. He barely graduated. He barely got his degree, Max. I know, but I love you. Stop it. (laughs) Stop it. Oh, my God. Oh, Michael Sheen's face is identical to our own right now. (laughs) Now he likes it. He's kind of into it. What the fuck? What the fuck is happening? I think he was kind of into Michael and he's kind of disappointed. Max, do you think of this as more of a vampire movie or a werewolf movie? Or neither? Um, I guess more of a werewolf movie. Really? Wow. Because, because like, 
even though we spend more times with the vampires, like there's very little, now that I think about it, like, I guess you're thinking of it as like, you think of it as a vampire movie because you spend so much time with them. They're like the focal point, but like also you forget they're vampires a lot of time. They're just, they're just people in military outfits, like yeah, shooting big dogs. And not even all the time are they big dogs. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, that wall exploded. Shoot him. You have guns. Isn't that your sole purpose? No, he's going to like punch him. Take that. Take that dog. I'll kill you. You're going to take a sword out of my fucking pocket <laughs> and then stab you. And he took it out like he was a fucking RPG villain. It was just like, oh, I, I had this. I just go in my inventory. The weird thing is there's not a very good understanding of the stakes because it's like, okay, yes, they could shoot him. But also she's like, who's like, what, whose side is she fucking on? Hers now. She has decided she loves Michael. The werewolves just don't want to be slaves. Stop yeah. shooting them. Yeah, he is literally is just like, hey, I know how the war started. You think that could be like, stop shooting the lichens. Yeah. No. God, Craven is just so irritating. Why the fuck is he there? What is going on? He was high. That was his closet to hide in. Okay. You know what the real problem is? I think we're going to come off as not liking this movie. No, it's more just too long. Do. It's just that when you watch it multiple times in a short period. Yeah. At the very least, if you just binge all of them and watch the sequels, at least new things are happening. Whereas this just feels like the same thing is happening over and over again. And everyone is just making dramatic revelations at one another. No, wait, Craven fucking tells her. Yeah. That makes no sense from a character standpoint. It should have been Lucian or Michael, you know, to give them a relationship together. You know what, Craven? That's how you're going to win her over, buddy. You're going to reveal that you knew the whole time that she was just manipulated and being lied to. And that actually Victor was behind it all. And you knew. And you <laughs> didn't say anything for 600 years. Uh. <laughs> this is how you show women you really care is you reveal how long you've been lying to them <laughs> about the identity of their family's killers. And meanwhile, have pants on sex with the blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and then smack them. Yes. Like, it is impossible for me discer to discern what his, like, goal is. Come with me to be by my side. Dude, like, take a hint at this point. Okay, spit it out. Again, most dramatic thing ever. Wait, what the fuck? Did his arm just transform? No, you, you just said the same exact thing during the pre-screening. Pre remember what? Remember, he has the arm blades from when the, he was chasing the car before? That's not what it looks like. I mean, that is the same blade, but it looks like he punches him and then the I know. blade just comes you out. You said the exact same thing during the pre-screening. <laughs> 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 the exact same reaction of what the fuck. Oh, God. Bite him. Bite him. Bite him. Do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want your boyfriend to look like that forever or do you just, you know, just bite him? Bite him. And then she does and she's like, I thought it was going to do something. And, and he's like, no, I just wanted to see you bite him. It gets me off. This entire I just thing, thought it would be funny. This entire thing has been like... It's a, just a joke. It's really like a really elaborate way to get my kink off. Like it's been <laughs> 600 years in the making. And are they officially cousins? Why is he calling him cousin? Is it just to reinforce the monogenetic? Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, just shoot him. Stop making such a fucking demonstration out of it. You know what I want, Max? Tell me what you want, what you I really, want, really want. I want Doom Guy to come in and then just rip Craven's head off and then just like shoot a rocket into if his Doom body. Doom Guy was in this movie, it would be 15 minutes long. Yeah, because he would just cut through the bullshit.
take that. <laughs> That's the second time he's disappeared. Fine, Craven. <laughs> oh, he's about to transform into like a blue man. <laughs> the blue man group. All three. He's going to transform into a Prometheus blue god <laughs> man. Basically, that's kind of what he looks Did like. Did I ever tell you what happened with my experience with Prometheus? What happened? Where I went into Prometheus just knowing it was a sci-fi movie made by Ridley Scott, and I didn't realize that it was supposed to tie into the alien universe. So, like, I didn't hate it when, right. when I saw it. And then, like, when everybody's like, oh, it's the worst thing ever. I'm like, not really. If you were expecting like the second coming of Christ and a new like, I don't I don't know like I don't know what people wanted that movie to be, but like, I'm on record as saying Prometheus ain't that bad unless like I don't know maybe it's not that bad if you don't expect it to be an alien it's just, movie. It's just nothing though. Yeah, it's, it's just true. like nothing. It's the same thing as the Suspiria remake where it's like the Suspiria remake technically has interesting choices so long as you pretend that the original Suspiria does not exist. But then when you think about that, it's like, like it's just kind of disappointing. Cause it's like the director. Oh God, what's his name? Who made call me by your name? How am I forgetting his name? Doopity doop doop. No, no, no. But he's just revealing himself to be like a tasteless asshole where it's like all the decisions you made. It's okay to make different decisions and remakes. In fact, I'd encourage it, but it's like, there was no reason to make this movie. There's just no reason to do yeah. it. And also the the decisions that they made in the Suspiria remake and the way that they did it, like the differences that happened between one and the other, it demonstrates that he does not understand the original movie. Well, we need to stop because Bill Nye, he's acting the fuck out of this scene. The abomination. It's Coven. Because Coven sounds like oven. Look at him. I had to protect the white purity that we're fighting yeah, for. The purity of the white race. Yeah. Oh, no. Way to go. You, you know what's weird? You know what I would like to see, Max, is Muppet Dracula. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the guy from Sesame Street. <laughs> Who's actually? Oh, look Dracula. how fast he is! He's so fast he doesn't even move. That's like some straight up anime shit. This looks kind of anime. The yeah. fact that he's just like blue and like not wearing a shirt now. But he's just like, and then he's so fast that he's just like he's there. Yeah, you don't even see movement. At which point, why are we even watching this? He's just wasting time. Yeah, you could have just killed him already. Yeah. You almost made me use one percent of my power. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm just going to snarl at your face <laughs> really close to you. And then we're going to do a ballet routine. I'm definitely not on a wire. Don't worry about it. That's honestly the most anime thing I've ever. You almost made me use one for <laughs> of my power. Human. <laughs> you don't remember that meme? Is that a actual anime thing that someone said? I mean, that's definitely things that's happened. Um, Dragon Ball. Bleach especially is terrible at, with using that. Bleach? Yeah, Bleach is bad. Don't watch it. Don't look into it. Just don't worry about Bleach. It was something I thought was good in middle school. <laughs> so, God. I feel like there was a point I was trying... Oh! I was trying to make a point about werewolves for like 20 minutes now. But one of the interesting things about what this movie does with werewolves is that it really transforms them from being a very much an individual who those trans like werewolf movies seem to be a lot about like the uncontrollable transformation. And then as we discussed in the curse of the werewolf movie yes. that we did, it's very much about like un endless desire that cannot be controlled. Right. And it's like, this one totally removes that. <laughs> uh, there's nothing about it. That's, that's different other than the arbitrary fact of like the racial difference, which again is arbitrary in this. There's really no difference between them in terms of behavior, at least. 
Um, and because of the way the, ooh, she just got fucking knocked out. Because of the way um, earlier iterations of the werewolf are very much about the individual, they take on tragic dimensions because it's like, oh, it's the monstrous individual. And then because of their monstrous behavior, the society is going to react and then destroy them. It's going to drop the hammer down. Whereas this one seems to be, as far as I know, the first one where it's like the werewolf collective. Oh my God, wait, no, we need to pause for the best part of the movie. This is so stupid. So if you're not watching this with us. Wait, one. One, two, two three, three, four, five, five six, seven, seven, eight, eight nine, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven. Yeah. 26 and a half. Yeah. And also just add one extra second onto that. So 27 and a half, because you started late. Yes. So what we were just doing is we were counting the seconds in between the time <laughs> Kate Beckinsale did the thing where she dashed and like cut him in half before he realized. And then the moment when his brain actually slid off. And in between that, halfway body. through, he like pulled out his dual blade. <laughs> it's from his sleeves. In between that, in between the time he gets cut in half, and then the moment he realizes he's been cut in half, he twists around, changes posture, removes his like blades, and then ha- like looks at her awkwardly. Yes, because she's like, no, look, like a kid who like is playing like paintball or something is like, no, look, I got you. Yeah. See, yeah, there's blood on the sword. And he's like, oh, you got me. That's not how that shit works. <laughs> You don't get to turn around and then fall in half. And now all the werewolves respect the blue man. Compared to before when they were going to kill him? Maybe. We don't know. But yeah, it's so... like that. That's like the most inexcusable thing <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> it's hilarious. Where, where I also love it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you don't get to turn around. <laughs> you don't get to turn around and do that. And, like, even anime that's, like, notorious for that shit, like, normally it's just, like, dash past and then, like... Instantly. Once the sword... Yeah. Like, they sheath the sword and then it's, like, tink. Yeah, it's, it's like... I don't know. It's a trope of all sorts of things. Yeah. But, like... Old samurai movies did it, too. Yeah. But even then, it was normally just, like, the splatter of blood and whatnot, but... Yeah, and it was supposed to show how, like, restrained... Yeah. ...the samurai was... I'm sure you can find any number of like Toshiro Mifune movie where he like some, but some bandit is like haranguing him and he's like, you shouldn't do this. And then the guy attacks him and he just like whips out his blade really quick. Yeah. And it's done. Yep. Kind of, uh, not the same here. Not, not that well done. There wasn't 30 seconds of the bandit being like, how dare you even assume that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just, just with everything with this movie. It's like from moment to moment, it does the most melodramatic thing possible. Or it takes conventions or moments that are in other things and then it makes that it. That was a weird dramatic. transition of like going into the wall for the black, but then like a hard cut to this. There's a lot of weird edits in this. And the fact that they just left this dude's body. They were, in a, they were in a hurry, okay. You know what else is weird? Similarity between this and Guillermo del Toro and Hellboy is that this is also the same way that Rasputin gets summoned back. Is that they kill the dude who I remember in a very amusing twist thought that these Nazis were actually going to give him gold. Yes. Nazi gold. And then they spill his blood onto like a giant like rune stone. And then Rasputin comes out. Of course. <laughs> but like I thought it had to be a vampire and they had to do with like the mirror ritual thing. I don't know. Is some random werewolf. No, that was just her leaving a voicemail. (laughs) Can you please get up? I need to talk to you. Listen, I'm going to explain some things so that when you wake up, you won't be as confused. Fuck you, Len Wiseman. No, thank you, Len Wiseman. This is, this has been a mainly enjoyable romp through a movie that is 45 minutes too long. Yeah. I mean, the thing is this movie's too long. We've watched it too many times in quick succession, but I don't want that to take away from like the potential of people enjoying it. 
it's like we want to try to enable people to like properly not shit on this movie and enjoy yes, it. Yes. Um, this movie is interested in the aesthetic. If you are also interested in this vampire goth industrial aesthetic, you're probably going to enjoy this movie at the very least as some sort of like screensaver to have on. That's that's a good way to describe it. And yeah. I, yet again, I, I like these. Because uh, what? This movie only had a budget of like. I think like 30 million or something. It doesn't look like the most expensive movie for sure. And you know what? For us, it's just that, that type of genre movie that we're kind of nostalgic for. Yeah. And also like, the same as last I don't know. I'm not like a big fan of like Kate Beckinsale, but she's fine. I kind of like her. I feel like if she had more opportunities to be like the vampire spandex woman. Yes. That would be a world I would prefer to live in. <laughs> If only. Um, we need more vampire yeah, 20, spandex 22 women. 22 million isn't too huge of a... Honestly, that's kind of small. Yeah. That's smaller than I thought it would have been. It made almost 100 million in the box office, so there you go. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, that's that's been Underworld. I'm trying to think of what else there is to say about it. I'm sure there are other things to say, but also, like, this is just an interesting cycle of vampire movies, and I really do hope we get an opportunity to revisit it with stuff like blade or something. Cause yeah. I think blade especially is a very interesting if you ever, iteration. If you ever get a hankering for underworld again, we can watch rise of the lichens together because that only requires knowledge. No, we can't skip number two. We can cause it's a rise of the lichens is a prequel to number one. No, we can't skip number two, man. Okay. Well, it's against the rules. If you want us, if you want us to do underworld two, let us know <laughs> um, on our various social media platforms. But don't let us know too soon. No, let us know immediately. Yeah, okay. On a- so, yeah, you can let us know <laughs> at spectatorfilmpodcast.com, and you can find the rest of our episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher, and we have a letterboxed account that I do not remember the name of. So you'll have to go to our website. Find, find it. it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, any last word, Max? Something clever. Pumpernickel. Uh, okay. I, you, you didn't say it.